Domestic Abuse Bill, as amended in the Public Bill Committee, to be considered. Now. We'll start with Government New Clause 15, with which it will be convenient to consider all the selected new clauses and amendments as listed on the selection paper. I call the Minister to move New Clause 15. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Home should be a place of love and of safety. But for 2.4 million people across the country, it is not. We want the abuse to stop and we want victims to live peaceful, safe and happy lives. This is why the Government is bringing forward the Domestic Abuse Bill. But domestic abuse does not just affect adults. It affects the children living in abusive households too. The Government has always recognised the devastating impact that domestic abuse has on a child who sees, hears or experiences it. Indeed, the need to consider the effects on children runs through the Bill, through the draft statutory guidance and in our non-legislative work. But as I hope uh, is acknowledged, um, our approach throughout the extensive scrutiny of this Bill has been to listen, and that is exactly what we have done. We have listened carefully to my right honourable friends, the Member for Maidenhead, and my right honourable friend, the Member for Basingstoke. We have listened to my honourable friend, the Member for the Cities of London and Westminster in Bill Committee, as well as other members across the House, including the Honourable Member for Bladen who have encouraged us to do more. And so I am pleased to introduce new clause 15 to the Bill, which states that children who see or hear or experience domestic abuse are victims. As with the statutory definition in clauses 1 and 2, we expect the new clause to be adopted more generally by public authorities, frontline practitioners and others responding to domestic abuse. Indeed, it is vital that locally commissioned services consider and address the impact of domestic abuse on children. We have also listened to the harrowing experiences of victims going through the family and civil courts. It is vital that victims of domestic abuse are supported to give their best evidence in court and to minimise the distress that this can cause. The Bill on Introduction already ensured that victims of domestic abuse are automatically entitled to special measures in criminal proceedings, meaning that they can, for example, give evidence from behind a screen or via a video link. New Clauses 16 and 17 now extend that automatic eligibility to victims giving evidence in family and in civil proceedings. In May last year, the Ministry of Justice established a panel of experts to review how the family courts deal with the risk of harm to children and parents in private law children's cases involving domestic abuse and other serious offences. The panel received more than 1,200 submissions and the report was published just a couple of weeks ago. The submissions highlighted that many victims of domestic abuse feel extreme anxiety about appearing in the family court and coming face to face with the perpetrator. And anyone who has tracked the progress of this bill or or who have worked with victims and listened to victims outside the confines of this chamber will know just how terrible some of those experiences can be. The panel has recommended that the provisions in the bill concerning special measures in the criminal courts should apply to all private law children's cases in which domestic abuse is alleged. New Clause 16 does that, and New Clause 17 achieves the same in civil proceedings. But we have gone further with regards to civil proceedings, as New Clause 18 prohibits cross-examination in person, where such cross-examination by the alleged perpetrator is likely to diminish the quality of the witness's evidence or would cause significant distress to the witness. This new clause also prevents the victim from having to cross-examine the alleged perpetrator themselves in person, with counsel being appointed by the court, if necessary, in each scenario. Such cross-examination can serve to re-traumatise victims and, again, prevent them from giving their best evidence in court. 
And so, cross-examination in person is already prohibited in the criminal courts. The Bill on Introduction extended the prohibition to the family courts, and on the recent recommendation of the Civil Justice Council, we will now ensure that the bar applies across all courts. These changes will have a profound impact on victims in all our constituencies who are seeking justice. Of course. I wholeheartedly support everything that the Minister has already said, but one of the additional factors excuse me, <clears throat> which can make it more difficult for a victim of domestic violence in particular um, to be able to feel secure in the system is that they have had a brain injury which might have not have been diagnosed. And so all the anxiety and the loss of memory and the loss of executive function um, may be completely misunderstood by many other people around her. And isn't it time that we made sure, as my amendment, new clause 13, would do, that all um, victims of domestic violence and abuse are screened for um, acquired brain injury? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman uh, for his intervention. I, I, I of course, um, pay attention to the fact that he, this has been a long-standing campaign for him on this matter. Uh, I've looked very carefully at his amendments, uh, and there are chiefly two concerns that we have as government. First of all, any clinical need must be um, uh, conduct must, the clinical need of the individual must, of course, be a matter for doctors. I, I would be very, very worried about uh, making a blanket application for anyone uh, uh, who is a victim of domestic abuse, not least because. Um, we know that uh, domestic abuse, as Clause 1 sets out, can take many forms and is not just restricted to physical violence. And so I do believe that the correct way to deal with the very important point he raises is to enable clinicians to make that judgment. But the second point is that um, in relation to uh, screening, I understand that uh, the UK uh, Screening uh, Authority would have to consider uh, whether such a universal programme should be introduced, and I believe that they have, rec they have looked at this relatively recently and have concluded that the evidence is not there. But if I may, I'm going to return to the text of my speech, and I will hear his arguments develop during the course of this afternoon and comment further if, if needs be. I was on the subject of uh, justice, and uh, one of the most chilling and anguished developments in recent times has been the increased use of the so-called rough sex defence. Uh, this is, is, is the subject matter of the last of the government's new clauses at report stage, new clause 20. And before I uh, develop the argument for this clause, I would like to pay particular tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Camberwell uh, and Peckham and to my honourable friend, the Member for Wire Forest. Yeah, yeah who have been uh, unrelenting in their work to secure justice for victims who, uh, about whom the most um, difficult and, and uh, uh, violent claims can be made by defendants in the course of a criminal trial, and they have been absolutely committed in their campaign to clarify the law. Indeed, I, I seem to remember the Honourable Gentleman, my Honourable Friend, uh, raised this at the first second reading uh, in October, which um, uh, reminds us all on the, of the journey that this uh, bill uh, has had. But they have called on government to codify the law in relation to the use of violence in consensual sadomasochistic sexual acts, as I say, the so-called rough sex Defence. I am incredibly grateful to them for their continued and constructive engagement on this very important and sensitive issue. And I note also the uh, support across the House uh, that uh, members um, uh, have given to these clauses, and I thank everyone for their work on this. Uh, uh, yes, I will. <laughs> Way and the Minister is setting the scene very clearly for what is important and what we wish to see happening, and I congratulate her on that. Uh, the, the increase of, of the uh, 
um, the, this type of activity by some 11.6% on the on on the the worldwide internet traffic has has concerned me. But it's not just the getting at the people individually, Minister. It's also getting at those people who are the drivers of it, who make it happen. So, what what's been done to ensure that those who perhaps buy into that that system or for inadvertently perhaps, but find themselves uh, nonetheless in a very very difficult situation, that they the, the drivers, those people who instigate it, who make it available, make it happen, can be caught. Uh, well, I, I, if, I'm, I, if I haven't, if I've understood the honourable gentleman correctly, uh, I think he is um, addressing not just the issue of the, the use of this so-called defence in our courts, but also reflecting on the uh, wider impact of pornography. If I've understood him correctly, uh, 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 particularly on internet pornography, on um, uh, violence uh, towards women and girls in particular. Uh, and I suspect, I know that my honourable friend for Congleton will be raising this in her speech. And so if I may, I'm going to respond to her in that part of the debate. But I very much take on board his point. Uh, and uh, he will know that part of the problem um, that has emerged uh, in the last 15, 20 years is that whereas in the old days... Um, uh, cases, of course, were reported freely in the newspapers and so on. Uh, nowadays, of course, such cases are also reported in, uh, on the internet. And uh, I must, in that regard, pay particular tribute to uh, the family of Natalie Connolly, uh, who uh, we all know has suffered in more ways than any one can really contemplate. And uh, I am pleased, and I hope they are, um, satisfied with the development uh, that, uh, uh, through the hard work of the honourable members, as I say, for uh, Camberwell and, and of Wild Forest, I hope that the, the family of Natalie are satisfied with where we have reached in this bill. We've been clear uh, that there is no such defence to serious harm which results from rough sex, but there is a perception that such a defence exists and that it is being used by men, and it is mostly men in these types of cases, to avoid convictions for serious offences or to receive a reduction in any sentence where they are convicted. As my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, indicated at second reading, this area of law is extremely complex. It was therefore important that anything which is placed in this bill does not have unintended consequences. In acting with the best of intentions, we do not want to create loopholes or uncertainties in the law inadvertently that can then be exploited by those who perpetrate such crimes. And may I um, take a moment just to thank my friend and my honourable friend, the member for Cheltenham, who has brought, as the uh, co-minister on this bill, has brought all of his legal expertise into the consideration of how we can address the mischief and the upset that we all want to address, but do so in a, in a way that does not have unintended consequences. Yes, of course. Can I just join with her in that? Because this is an issue which has bedeviled the criminal law since, I think, cases going back to the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, and it's been an attempt in the past to fit uh, uh, appropriate legal protections within the framework of the Offences Against the Person Act. And it's particularly to be welcomed now that we've moved away from that uh, rather antiquated straitjacket and have something that's fit for purpose. So the work that the government and my honourable friend have done on this is of immeasurable importance to legal practitioners as well as to victims. Very much. I'm, I'm happy to take that uh, intervention and to thank him for his, uh, um, for his support uh, as the chair of the Justice Select Committee. Uh, what, what the Honourable Lady, Right Honourable Lady and my Honourable Friend have sought to do in their new clauses 4 and 5 is to broadly codify the principles set out in current case law in this area, namely that which resulted from the case of the Crown and Brown, a case that involved a group of men who participated in sadomasochistic activities. We have taken up this challenge and, working closely with them, uh, we have tabled new clause 20 to achieve just that. More specifically, the new clause aims to make clear that consent to serious harm for sexual gratification is not a defence in law. The new clause codifies and therefore restates 
the general proposition of law expressed in the case of Brown, which is that a person may not consent to the infliction of serious harm and, by extension, their own death. Uh, it will, for those who um, are interested in such matters, uh, they will note that we have been careful to preserve the position in relation to uh, the uh, transition or transmission of sexual, sexually, trans, uh, sexually transmitted uh, infections, uh, but we have done so in, in uh, very much in keeping with current case law. So I hope that the House has been reassured that new Clause 20 achieves the objective of providing the confirmation and clarification of the law requested. Now, I'm very conscious that uh, there are many backbenchers who wish to speak, and indeed, sadly, many who have put in to speak but um, haven't, you know, won't, be, won't be called because of the, uh, the House's interest in this important piece of legislation. But I, if I may, I'm going to take uh, just a little bit of time to address an issue that I know is of great importance, not just to those of us in this place, but also to uh, those who work in um, the world of tackling domestic abuse and, of course, uh, the victims uh, themselves. And that is the issue of migrant women, and uh, in particular migrant women who have no recourse to public funds. And I'm going to deal, if I may, with new clause 22, 25 and 26 in this part of my speech. The government's position uh, is uh, that um, uh, the... And I hope, incidentally, that Honourable Members received a Dear Colleague letter this morning from my, my Honourable Friend for Cheltenham and me uh, to explain our position. We are absolutely committed to doing what we can to support all migrant victims of domestic abuse as victims, first and foremost. In 2012, we introduced the Destitution Domestic Violence Concession, the DDVC, to support migrant victims of domestic abuse who are living in this country on the basis of certain partner visas. Such people have come to the UK with the intention of living here permanently, with the reasonable expectation of obtaining indefinite leave to remain. The DDVC is not available to people who enter the country on other visas, such as visitor, student or work visas, or indeed anyone who is here illegally. This is because in order to obtain such visas, they will have confirmed that they are financially independent and therefore require no recourse to public funds, and their stay will be for a defined period of time. They do not, therefore, have a legitimate expectation of securing indefinite leave to remain. Simply extending the DDVC to all migrant victims is therefore not the way to address the needs of migrant victims who cannot claim uh, currently under that scheme. We need to find a way of ensuring that they have adequate support rather than provide a pathway to indefinite leave to remain or a blanket lifting of the no recourse to public funds condition. Last July, we committed in our response to the joint uh, uh, committee that scrutinised the draft bill to review the government's response to migrant victims of domestic abuse. We published the findings of this review last week. Despite our call for evidence to support this review, there is currently a lack of evidence to demonstrate which cohorts of migrant, migrants are likely to be most in need of support the numbers involved, and how well existing arrangements may address their needs. Without clear information that identifies the groups of migrants who may be most in need of support, it is not possible to ensure that any additional funding or support services are targeted correctly and effectively. We need to address these evidence gaps before we are in a position to take well-grounded decisions on how best to protect these victims in the long term. That is why this Government is launching a £1.5 million pilot, the Support for Migrant Victims Scheme. As I announced at second reading, the purpose of this pilot is to determine how we can ensure that victims can obtain immediate access to support and that any future strategy 
meets the immediate needs, needs of victims and is fit for purpose. Of course. Thank you, Minister, for giving way, and I do welcome the, the points she has previously made on the other topics. But on this, if she wants to do further research and investigation, why not just lift the provisions and requirements on no recourse for public funds in the meantime? until the research is completed and until she has yeah. more information about what she wants to do next. Uh, the Honourable Lady makes a point that I know at first blush uh, uh, would uh, be attractive. The problem we have, though, is that, as I say, we do not have that bedrock of evidence. Uh, we are coming to the dispatch box with, as I say, an open heart, and I would hope, as I say, across the House, it's acknowledged that that has been our approach throughout this Bill. We um, have asked, we, uh, if, if the Honourable Lady has had a chance, I don't know, to read our report uh, that we published last week into the work that the Home Office has done. Um, there has been some very good work by uh, charities through the tampon tax funding and so on, but we are, we are not able to put those figures in that we need to be able to undertake the sort of uh, reform she is urging upon us. We must have the data to ensure that anything that we are putting forward in the longer term uh, best meets the needs of victims and is sustainable. She will know that if the needs of a person who comes to this country, for example, on a six-month visitor visa, which is uh, one of the categories that uh, certainly one of the, the uh, witnesses that gave evidence to the Joint Committee in their evidence that they gave to us uh, as part of this review, the South Black Sisters, she will know that um, people on visitor visas, who, they may be here on, for six months, let's say, uh, they will have made uh, uh, representations to the Home Office very specifically on their financial circumstances, and we want to ensure that we can treat such people fairly and give them the access to help that they need. It's why we're very keen to focus on support rather than um, uh, perhaps follow the uh, urgings of others that we deal with immigration status first before we look at support. We want to help these women access, uh, these victims I should say, access help first and foremost as victims. And so the pilot programme uh, is to determine how we can ensure victims can obtain immediate access to support and any future strategy meets the immediate needs of victims and is fit for purpose. Support for migrant victims is a, a very, very important issue for all of us. Uh, we recognise that, uh, which is why we are committed to launching the pilot project as quickly as possible. We are currently reviewing the options for implementing the pilot and we expect to make further announcements in the summer ahead of its launch in the autumn. We must resist the urge to act before we have the evidence on which to base comprehensive proposals to ensure that measures are appropriate. Now, as I say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to give plenty of time to members of this House to debate um, the Bill at this important stage of its scrutiny. Uh, but before I do, may I thank honourable members, I hope uh, not too soon, um, for the very, very constructive collegiate approach we have taken, all of us, on this Bill. I know that there are some very, very um, different viewpoints that may be held on particular issues that will be debated in this chamber this afternoon, but I know that this House will keep it at, it at the forefront of its mind that the reason we are debating this Bill is because we all want to help victims of domestic abuse and we all want the, the abuse to stop. The question is that new clause 15 be read a second time. Um, as the Minister has just said, there is a lot of interest, not surprisingly, in wanting to take part in this debate. And so for the first four um, non-government contributors, seven minutes, thereafter five minutes, and even with that, I'm afraid not everybody is going to get in. Jess Phillips. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, first I would like to start by saying that we on the Labour benches fully support all of the government's new clauses and amendments today. Many of them, and in fact many of the changes to the bill since its very first draft all those many moons ago, have been things that we on this side of the House have championed from both the front and back benches. The government have taken an approach throughout this process of this whole bill of seeking to always try to improve it. 
And for this, we are very grateful. And the victims in this country will be grateful. The bill still has a number of processes to go through in the other place, and I very much hope that the government will continue to have this attitude to positive change as the bill progresses. Although, let's hope it progresses maybe quicker than it has in the past. To touch on a number of the government's amendments very briefly, in support, the changes suggested to the family courts were by and large amendments tabled by the Labour Party um, at committees, and they come hot on the heels of the Family Law Panel Review, which was very good, thorough and a timely piece of work. I want to praise my honourable friends, the members for Hove, for Sheffield Healy, for Swansea East and for Gower, who worked tirelessly on behalf of their constituents and victims across the country to seek that review. With a very special mention to Women's Aid, Rachel Williams, Sammy Woodhouse and Claire Throssell. Yeah. All victims and campaigners who have pushed family law reform for victims of sexual and domestic violence through their own pain, suffering and loss. Turning to the amendments including children in the definition of domestic abuse, this was again an amendment tabled by the Labour Party at committee and for this we are eternally grateful and I look forward to seeing it in today's amended bill. A huge thanks for this goes to all the children and young people who joined the campaign to speak of their experiences of living with domestic abuse and without question how this had victimised them. I want to say thank you to Charlie Webster and in memory of Carl, Jack and Daniel. We once again pay tribute to them. To all the children's charities from national groups like Action for Children, Bernardo's, the NSPCC and the Children's Society. To local grassroots campaigners like Free Your Mind in London, We Are in Birmingham and We're All Women's and Children's Aid in Merseyside. Thank you for all seeing those children and fighting for them. As for amendments regarding the rough sex events, so ably championed by the inimitable Right Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham, the Member for Wire Forest and the new Member for Newbury and the brilliant campaign We Can't Consent to This. I simply want to say one thing. Natalie Connolly's name and story has rung out around this chamber, been told in many newspapers and the bravery of her family will see this law changed. Today, I don't want to remember her for how she died or to allow a violent man to get to say what her story was. I simply want to remember Natalie, a brilliant, beautiful, bright mother, sister, daughter, a woman who had a story all of her own about the things she loved and cared for. I hope that now the story of Natalie Connolly can be that, one that centres her as a human, just like all of us, not the story that somebody else told. Now, as the Minister has alluded to, turning to new clause 23 uh, in my name and the names of the Leader of the Opposition, we return to what seems now an age-old issue of how we deal with victims of domestic abuse with no recourse to public funds. At committee, the Minister and I disagreed over the terminology of who we were talking about while I decided to refer to our care workers, our NHS workers, people in this building serving us our drinks to highlight the kind of people I am talking about when I refer to people with no recourse to public funds. The Minister, quite rightly, cited evidence of asylum seekers or even those with irregular immigration status. Fundamentally, it doesn't matter which rhetorical side of the fence we fall. We're talking about people, humans, who, when they have been raped, beaten, controlled and abused, before we ask them how we can help, first, we ask what stamp is in their passport. This cannot be right. And what is more is that the situation as it is today is not only hindering support to victims, it is helping to leave rapists, abusers and violent perpetrators on our streets. Since our debate at committee, a number of police officers from across the country have been in touch with me, and this is what they told me. One officer said, For years now we have faced difficulties trying to effectively safeguard subjects of very serious offences. 
There are some things in place, such as the destitution domestic violence concession, but this process can take weeks to sort. The refuges are usually very helpful, but they obviously can't operate without being paid. So we are often left with subjects being isolated in hotels for weeks, which is a bad outcome for everyone. Another officer from a different force got in touch and said, the current situation has a serious impact on the police's safeguarding duties. It also has a knock-on effect in our ability to investigate domestic abuse as crimes, since officers are distracted by the need to find alternative safe accommodation and support, rather than concentrate on their primary role, which is to investigate the commission of potential criminal offences. The Minister certainly is right to seek evidence, and so I look to my own force at West Midlands Police, a place obviously close to my heart, and there the Police Public Protection Unit last year, out of police force funding, spent £23,161 on temporary accommodation. While some of this will be due to the pressure upon refuge places, I understand from them that a common reason is accommodating victims with no recourse to public funds from police resources. So as the Minister seeks to gather evidence, I wonder if she will ask every police force how much are we spending on police money, that is money that could fund a police officer, that exact amount, how much are we spending on temporary accommodation through our police services? The government's own draft guidance essentially admits that no recourse to public funds is a barrier to women getting out of abusive situations. In the government's words, victims who have entered the UK from overseas may face additional barriers when attempting to escape domestic abuse that are related to their lack of access to public services and funds, leading to higher dependence on the partner or family that has supported their being in the UK. This may be exploited by partners or family members to exert control over victims. So the police are saying this is a problem. All of the expert charities, bar none, are saying it is a problem. Members of Parliament who face these issues every day are saying it is a problem. And in fact, the government's own guidance highlights that it is a problem and is in fact being used by perpetrators So why don't we seek to fix the problem? The amendment we have tabled today seeks to meet the government in the middle, using what they highlighted on committee. We are suggesting that for the year of the pilot project outlined by the government, that they pilot the end to no recourse to public funds for victims of domestic abuse. We have listened to the government's concerns regarding the pathways to settle status and tried to essentially plead with ministers to test if giving these victims access to public funds will make a difference. The experts all say it will. And whilst I recognise what the ministers are saying about needing hard data, you cannot prove a negative And we will never know the amount of people for whom, when they turned up to access, when access wasn't available, they were turned away. I will. I'm I'm very grateful for giving away. I'm sure she'll agree with me that we're in a position where we just don't know what the picture is. And if we were to do away temporarily with the no recourse to public funds, that would then bring people forward in confidence that they weren't going to be penalised in any other way. I absolutely agree, and I don't agree just because it suits my purpose. I agree as somebody with a vast amount of experience of handling cases of victims with no recourse to public funds, both as a support worker and as a Member of Parliament. My heart sinks when somebody tells me they have no recourse, when I know there is very little I can do. And that's when they're coming to me, somebody who knows the different possible pilots that are happening With the greatest respect to members in this House, does everybody know how they would go about accessing exactly what was needed? So now think of Sue, who's at your local homelessness centre. The reality is, is we will never know how many get turned away. That data will never be available. But by dropping no recourse, we can look to see if it works. As legislators, if we know something is a problem, 
We have a responsibility to address it. Our ideology should always be trumped by facts. I understand often making law is complicated. What might be the consequences of this or the repercussions of that? Risks, benefits, checks, balances. But I think this bill today is quite simple, actually. Today we are making a law that is trying to save people from domestic abuse. New Clause 25, tabled by the Opposition, seeks to insert a non-discrimination clause into the Bill to ensure all are protected. If we stand here today and create a Bill that not unintentionally, not accidentally, but purposefully and willfully excludes some from safety, then we say they do not matter. We say that their life is just not as important to us. In these votes, we will be deciding whose lives are worth trying to save and how serious we are about trying to save them. Our new clause seeks to meet the government in the middle. It's certainly not, as the Minister knows from the many amendments that I laid in committee, necessarily what I would always have wanted, but it seeks to meet the government in the middle, and I simply ask that they walk towards us. Moving on to new clause 23, this seeks to expand in an area where the bill is very good, the area that puts the duty on local authorities to provide accommodation-based services. This part of the bill was hard won and it is something I will be thrilled to see on the statute books. It has the potential to put refuge services finally on a sustainable footing. However, 70% of domestic abuse victims do not receive services in refuge but instead are supported in community-based services. The victims in these services are often highest risk of harm and homicide, and we wish to see the same level of sustainability and strategy here as we do in refuge services. I spoke last week to a brilliant community worker in Merseyside who told me that their service, which has only four support workers, is currently supporting 776 complex domestic abuse cases. She had yet to receive any money from the announced COVID-19 schemes and that would only last until October anyway. She told me how the easing of lockdown and the good and right national conversation about domestic abuse was massively increasing the numbers and the complexity of their caseload. What our clause seeks to do is place a duty on all relevant public bodies, not just local authorities, to do their part in commissioning domestic abuse services in the community. Every single health commissioner, for example, should have a duty to be looking at what local domestic abuse services they can provide. Instead, as it stands, for example, some A&E departments have specialist domestic abuse workers on site, like the hospitals in Birmingham do, but the vast majority do not. If public bodies are working with people, they are working with victims of domestic abuse. All should do their part. The new clause also seeks to ensure that specialist groups catering for child victims, disabled victims those working with perpetrators of abuse, LGBT victims, male victims, older victims, and services run by and for black and minority ethnic women are considered and proper strategies are in place to protect them. Groups like Sister Space in Hackney, which offers specialist services for black women, or Stay Safe East, one of only a tiny number of specialist disabled victim services, live hand-to-mouth, never knowing how sustainable their services might be. They rely on crowdfunders and fund runs to fund life-saving services. I remember what it was like working in these services. Every January, drafting up letters to put community-based staff on notice because we didn't know if our project, for example, catering for child victims or stalking victims would be funded after April. This is the reality for the vast majority of community services in this country. The Bill recognises that refuge needs to be put on a sustainable footing. Bravo. It's absolutely brilliant. 
I did say that I was, might retire when that happened. I think to the honourable, right honourable member for Basingstoke, I'd like to renege on that sometimes. Not even I tell the truth. We must give the same attention to vital life-saving community services which support the vast majority of victims in this country. Today, 120 specialist community-based support services from all across our country have written to the government and to all of us. They said, our services have remained open during COVID-19. Our staff have moved heaven and earth to make that so. Ensuring that we don't let victims of abuse down, now we look to you, the government, to continue that commitment by pledging to recognise the huge contribution of community-based services in the Domestic Abuse Bill. Our new clause today would do this. With new clause 24, we seek to once and for all take decisive action to protect the lives of children who live with domestic abuse and have their cases heard in the family courts. Between 2006 and 2019, at least 21 children were killed during contact with fathers who were perpetrators of domestic abuse. The government's own report released last week states that many mothers explained how they had fled the relationship with the father in order to protect their children, only to find that protection undermined or destroyed by the family court. We on the opposition benches recognise that the government, especially the, uh, the member for Cheltenham, that they have committed to a review of the pro-contact family court culture and how, in some cases, it is endangering the lives and welfare of children. I have heard ministers and secretaries of state stand in this chamber and cite the case of Claire Thrussell, whose two sons, Jack and Paul, were murdered by their father after he was granted contact. We should not just say her name or think of her loss as some grisly exception. It has been shown by the government's own commissioned review that there is a systematic problem and we should act now to save lives and improve the safety of our country's children while we have this bill in front of us. At the very least, the government should seek to ensure that their planned review is time-bound to conclude with the return of this bill from the other place because if it is not, then we could lose the legislative opportunity that this presents to us. The argument to end the presumption of contact for proven violent perpetrators is, in my mind, made. Children are already dead. I do not want to have to call for an urgent question to ask ministers where we are with the review each time a new case of a child homicide hits the media. I want us to act now, or at least to commit to a short time frame of when and how the government will act. I have no doubt that the ministers from both the Home Office and the Ministry of Justice understand the severity and importance of this and, like we do, would not want to kick the safety of our children into the long grass. Yeah. Amendments 40 and 43 relate to the degree of independence afforded to the Commissioner of Domestic Abuse. The bill before us deviates from the precedent set for the Children's Commissioner by requiring reports and advice to be submitted to the Home Office rather than Parliament. Our amendments retain the statutory requirement for safeguarding considerations, but removes the possibility of the Home Office interfering or putting on undue pressure or, in reality, just delaying in the Commissioner's work. Every Commissioner who gave evidence to Parliament in consultation for this Bill supports this approach. We won't be pressing these amendments to a vote today, but we are keen to see further debate on the Commissioner once this Bill arrives at the other place. We do not stand here today to fight a political battle. The Domestic Abuse Bill has all of our fingerprints across its pages. Its very existence sends a message to the victims in this country that we can see them, and to the perpetrators that we will not tolerate them. We table these amendments and new clauses because, as has been the case since the first inception of the Bill, so many, many moons ago. We want it to be the best it can be and for it to ensure that no matter who you are, where you come from, where you work, if you need refuge or want support in your own home, that here 
in this great Britain, we want to help you, because that is the kind of country we are, one that leaves no victim behind. Move on to the seven-minute limit. Theresa May. Thank you, you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I say how much I welcome the fact that this bill has returned for report and third reading. Uh, This is a very important bill, and I'm not going to be able to speak in third reading, Mr Deputy Speaker, so may I take this opportunity of thanking the ministers who have shown their significant commitment to this bill in taking it through uh, committee stage and through this House. Uh, Also to thank all the officials in the Home Office and the Ministry of Justice who I know from my time in the Home Office, for for those officials, also have a very real commitment to seeing that we have improved legislation to help the victims of domestic abuse. But I'd also like to thank all members of this House, because this is truly a bill where there has been cross-party support and where every effort has been made to ensure that the bill can go through in the best shape that it can. Now, I'll come on to an area where there is, obviously, as we've seen, a difference of opinion across this chamber. But I think this has been an excellent example of this House at its best, working with government to improve the lives of victims up and down this country. I wanted to welcome particularly two of the uh, amendments that the government has put forward. First of all, the amendment in relation to children. Um, I've said before in this chamber, this is, uh, and as uh, my honourable friend the Minister uh, uh, referenced, this is an important area, because for too long we just turned a blind eye to the impact that domestic abuse had on children in a home in which that abuse was taking place. And it is absolutely right that we should now recognise that those children are also affected, their lives are affected, and that so many, actually their whole future adulthood, has been affected by what they have experienced, seen or heard within their home where domestic abuse is taking place. Um, I also wanted to particularly welcome the um, reference that the the way in which the government has dealt with the issue of the rough sex defence and to pay tribute to my honourable friend, the member for Wild Forest and the right honourable member for Camberwell and Peckham for the campaign that they have fought to keep this at the forefront of thinking and ensure that some changes could be made in relation to this, uh, to this bill. I do want to pick up on the area which uh, from, is clear from what the Shadow Minister has just said is an area of disagreement across this chamber in relation to migrant women. Um, I and others across this House will, of course, have dealt with cases of constituents who have come to this country um, very often with the hope and expectation that they would marry and have a happy and settled life here in the future, only to find themselves the victims of domestic abuse and to find that their immigration status or their uncertain immigration status is being used by their abusers as further a further way to abuse them and to keep them within that abusive relationship. Obviously, the DDVC um, acted in relation to those who are here on partner uh, visas, but there is this concern that there are those who still fall through the net uh, and are finding themselves unable to access the support that is necessary for them. I take the point that the Minister made earlier that those who have come on other visas have generally, in fact, if not in all cases, had to show their financial support here, that they have that independent financial support. But, of course, it is perfectly possible that they might find themselves in a relationship where the removal of that financial support is part of the abuse that they are suffering. And so we have to take account of that as we're looking at this issue. But it seems to me, having heard both the Minister and the Shadow Minister, that actually what we're looking at here is an intention on both sides of this House to identify what, uh, you know, the numbers of these cases, the evidence for these cases, um, but a difference of approach in which to do that. I think in these areas it is particularly important that we make sure, it's important in all aspects of dealing with um, domestic abuse, but it's particularly important in these cases that no action is taken which inadvertently leads to a further abuse or to an increase of abuse and to people finding themselves the subject of abuse um, in order to achieve something that has been enabled by the legislation. Mm-hmm. And that's why I do take the view um, uh, that, uh, that the government's approach of having this pilot, of looking at the cases and finding the best ways to target support for those cases, is the right way forward. But this is a difficult area. It's an area in which we know that there are those who find themselves um, 
unable to access su su support despite the abuse that they are receiving. So it is important that in putting that pilot together, the government does it in a way that we're going to be able to ensure that it can identify the evidence that it is looking for, but then be able to take the measures necessary from on the basis of that evidence and to do that in a timely fashion. Um, in relation to the bill more generally, I wanted to reference, if I may, just two or three other issues. The uh, Shadow Minister has just referenced healthcare uh, and, and in talking about other organisations in providing support and services. I just want to say how important I think it is that within our healthcare system, uh, those who are, who are uh, interacting with victims of domestic abuse are able to be in a position to identify where that domestic abuse is taking place. There is some evidence that where GPs are trained, actually they are able to identify at a much earlier stage and intervention can take place and support can take place at an earlier stage. And I think we, need a greater, we do need a greater emphasis on this issue of domestic abuse within um, uh, the healthcare services, particularly as it can lead to other issues. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of mental health, not just physical uh, well, uh, health, but mental health as well, and of course, sadly, in some cases, can lead to suicide too. Um, I wanted to mention employers, because a lot of employers post-COVID are going to think it's wonderful that everybody can work at home. But for, t for those who are the victims of domestic abuse, home is not a safe place. And so I urge employers to give thought, when they're looking at encouraging employees to work at home, to give thought to those who need to be in the workplace in order to be away from an abuser. Yeah. The government's taken some important steps during the um, uh, COVID-19 crisis in terms of funding but also publicity around domestic abuse issues. I urge the government to maintain those steps. And I also urge the government, I'm afraid I'm on a time, strict time limit, not a minute. I get an extra minute. God, it's so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's so long I'd forgotten. Yes. Oh, <laughs> giving way. Um, would she agree with me that some of the posters that we've seen during the course of COVID, where it has emphasised that domestic abuse is something that always works at home, have been incredibly compelling in getting the message that she is seeking to make across? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> friend. I, also, I would also say that I think there are some, certainly my, one of the, uh, some of the local health trusts in my area in Berkshire put small videos together which were giving out messages about the support that is available. And I think the important message that support is available to people who are the victims of uh, domestic abuse. Um, I also hope that the government is going to publicise this bill. It's important that victims and perpetrators know the implications of this bill, and particularly on something uh, like the uh, domestic abuse protection orders and notices, that actually others can... Uh, it isn't up to the victim to apply for those orders. Others, third parties, can apply for those orders. Perpetrators need to know that. But overall, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a very important bill. I welcome the cross-party support across this House... Uh, I hope it is going to have a swift passage through the other place, because the sooner this bill is on the statute book, the sooner we can provide extra support and help to the victims of domestic abuse, and the sooner we can say to them, we are on your side, we understand, we want to help, it's not your fault, and the sooner we say to perpetrators, this has got to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Cooper. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, begin by just welcoming the work that the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead has done on domestic abuse over many years, the personal interest she's taken in this, uh, and the work both on coercive control and also to get this uh, bill started in the first place. Can I also welcome the, the bill itself and also the amendments that the Government has brought forward, particularly uh, those around strengthening protections for children, uh, strengthening protections in court and also ending the appalling rough sex defence and the response that the Government has made to members right across this House who have been campaigning so powerfully for added measures and for changes to protect people from from this awful crime, uh, this torture in the home. And the importance of this bill and these measures has only grown during the coronavirus crisis as we have seen perpetrators exploit lockdown to increase their control and to increase abuse and the increases uh, in calls to helplines and concerns that we have seen. And also the fact that since the beginning of lockdown, 35 women and children have been murdered uh, by someone, uh, by a partner or ex as well. I want um, 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, to speak particularly to new clauses 32 and 33, which have cross-party support, and also to pay tribute to Laura Richards at Paladin, who is behind a lot of this work, and encourage the government to look at the report that she has published today, because there is a serious gap in the way that our system responds to the risk from serial perpetrators of abuse. There are systems in place, there are marrocks to manage the risks to repeat victims, but there are no proper systematic approaches in place to monitor or tackle repeat perpetrators. Dangerous people, predominantly dangerous men, who may go on to become ever more dangerous. To make sure that when the call comes in about domestic abuse by someone who has been convicted before for abuse against someone else, that it isn't just treated as a new one-off offence, to make sure that there are systems in place to join up the dots, to link police, probation, support services all together, to monitor people who have a series of previous domestic abuse or stalking convictions, so that if they start a new relationship, the police and local services know that a new family is at risk and can take action. Too often, that doesn't happen. Claire's Law doesn't solve that problem because it relies on an individual asking about an offender's history. Well, what if they don't know to ask? What if they are too scared to ask? And why is it still left to victims to ask for help rather than having a proper system in place to monitor those serial abusers and offenders? As Laura Richards points out, professionals load up the victim with actions in the safety plan, but rarely do the multi-agency problem solving and risk management regarding the perpetrator. So new clause 32 calls on the government to properly review the way serial abusers are monitored and managed and to publish that review swiftly. New clause 33 sets out a stronger way to support, uh, to respond to serial abuse by bringing them into the process for managing serious offenders, the multi-agency public protection arrangements, the MAPAs, uh, so that serial domestic abuse perpetrators and stalkers can be properly addressed. So far, the government has resisted that. They said, in response to our Select Committee report recommendation on this a few years ago, well, we will work with the police, we'll work with existing information systems. Those information systems are not working. The Police National Database on this is just far too sporadic, far too patchy in the way that police officers respond to this across the country. They've said they don't want a standalone register. This doesn't have to be a standalone register. The whole point is to bring this into the existing MAPA process, the existing visor process that is currently used for sex offenders and for the most serious violent offenders. We have processes that can work. Why not use them for serial uh, domestic abusers who can escalate that abuse as well? Nor is it good enough for the government to simply say, well, there's a lot of good work underway. We've got to respond to pilots. We've already heard them say, in response to my honourable friend's really powerful speech from the front bench, about the need to address uh, cases around no recourse to public funds and for migrant women, that we need to wait for pilots. In that case, it's not enough to respond to pilots. We should be taking some action while we wait for those pilots to conclude. And similarly, on serial domestic abusers, by all means, let's have different pilots and different measures in place about how best to respond to perpetrators, but let's get on with having the systems that can join up the information so that the police and probation can work together so they know who those dangerous serial abusers are. And the tragedy of this is that Laura Richards' report lists case after case after case where this did not happen. Case after case where someone has been murdered and where the killer had a history, where the killer had abused many times before and where the police and the probation services and others didn't have a system in place to identify that and to respond. It has happened too many times. And if the ministers won't listen to me, won't listen to the select committee when we make these recommendations, 
Perhaps they will instead listen to the calls from the families of victims, listen to the words of John Clough, the father of Jane Clough, who said, it's way past time serial abusers and stalkers were treated in the same way as, with the same gravitas as sex offenders and managed in a similar fashion. Or someone, uh, or Celia Peachy, who's the daughter of Maria Stubbings, who said, my mum was failed and the lessons have not been learned. Our current system is failing women and children. Violent men must be made visible. Men with violent histories must be checked and joined up. So I would urge the Minister not to simply reject these amendments out of hand, even if they are not yet able to accept new Clause 33, which sets up that system and that process to manage serial offenders, to at least agree to new Clause 32, to urgently review the way that the risk management is done of these serial abusers and offenders across the country and report back so that we can keep more women safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Note. The Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak once more on the Domestic Abuse Bill. It has been several times now, and it is an honour to follow my right honourable friend, the Member for Maidenhead, who has given so much passion and commitment to this incredibly serious issue, and of course to follow the Chair for the Home Affairs Select Committee, who has demonstrated very ably that it is possible to work on a cross-party basis, Mr Deputy Speaker, even convincing me to add my name to some of her amendments. She makes a very good case about the importance of identifying and registering serial perpetrators of domestic abuse so that victims can be forewarned of what they are getting themselves into, potentially. I'm conscious there are many members here this afternoon who wish to speak, but I'm also conscious that we are missing the Honourable Member for Canterbury, who has spoken so passionately in this House. I hope that this afternoon all of us can be a voice for her. My Honourable Friend the Minister has worked incredibly hard on this bill, uh, and during its, passion, she has, during its passage she's still made time to listen to many backbench members who have wanted to uh, raise their concerns. And I appreciate that she has brought forward a series of amendments at report stage which demonstrate that she has been listening. And of course those areas where she has not been able to bring forward amendments and new clauses, she's still shown a commitment, and I use as an example uh, the conversations I've had with her about the reporting of domestic abuse and that it should be recorded whatever the age of the victim. She has undertaken to continue to work with the Office for National Statistics because we know tragically that abuse can occur at any age. Just being a pensioner does not somehow make you immune or exempt. And it is crucially important that we have the statistics uh, and that she continues that work so that we can understand the full scale of the problem. I am relieved, Mr Deputy Speaker, to see the inclusion of new clauses that give greater protection to children who witness abuse and the commitment on housing for victims of abuse. And finally, after an incredible pincer movement by the Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham and my Honourable Friend, the Member for Wire Forest, we have new clause 20, which will bring to an end the so-called rough sex defence. Truly, I think that clause and much of the other work that has gone on shows that this place is better when we can put aside the adversarial nature of the House and make sure that we find cross-party solutions. However, inevitably, I'm going to turn to some of the areas on which we have failed to find cross-party solutions and less consensus. My honourable friend will be aware of the amendment I tabled new clause 34, which seeks to make it an offence to disclose private, to threaten to disclose private photographs. We all know from the debates that we have had and the representations that we have received that abuse occurs in many forms. It can be financial. It can be the withdrawal of a passport. It can involve mental co control and coercive control. It is already an offence to share private intimate images or films. And the amendment I put forward sought to make it a specific offence to threaten to do so, because that is part of the mental control that abusers use over their victims. It need not necessarily be an actual act but the threat of an act. Refuge, Refuge has launched its new campaign today, The Naked Threat, which highlights the alarming figure of one in seven young women having been on the receiving end of threats to share intimate or sexual images. 72% of those threats came from a current or former partner. That clearly puts it into the category of domestic abuse. And although I accept that it may not be for this bill today, I want to assure the Minister that this is something I will return to in the future. Today, I can be a voice for Natasha, who described the repeated threats over years of intimate images being shared, destroying her reputation as like having a bucket of ice-cold water thrown over her. 
she was gripped by the terror of feeling exposed and ashamed. And secondly, and this is an issue on which I seek specific reassurance from the Minister, and I have a great deal of respect for the Honourable Member for Kingston upon Hull North, but she has tabled new clause 28, which I'm sure will be debated at length this afternoon. However, my view is that this bill is simply not the right place yeah. for that debate. It would permit different treatment for women who were victims of abuse to that of other women. It would potentially requ require clinicians over a telephone consultation to determine whether a patient was a victim of abuse and possibly open up those clinicians to subsequent legal challenge. I do believe that this is an issue that we must return to in this House. We must have a thorough and full debate on abortion rights. But specifically this afternoon, I do not believe is the time to do so. I give way to the Minister. For giving way. Uh, she knows that there have been a range of views expressed in recent days, including by two Royal Colleges, on uh, New Clause 28 and what it seeks to uh, achieve. And indeed, there are difficulties with that clause. Uh, and so the Government considers the right way forward is to undertake a public consultation on whether to make permanent the current COVID-19 measure allowing for home use of early medical abortion pills up to 10 weeks gestation for all eligible women. Does that reassure her? Friend, for that commitment, and I, I look forward to that consultation coming forward. I think it's important that we have the opportunity to look at how these emergency regulations have worked during the period of COVID, that we understand how they can assist women, and that we, we further look at this. And I'm sure that when he uh, winds up the debate this afternoon, my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, will say something of it in his closing comments. I don't know whether the appropriate place is via new legislation coming forward, whether it is the consultation that my honourable friend has referred to, but there clearly is a real need for debate, for this House to be able to express its view and understand the issue thoroughly. The honourable member, the Shadow Minister, has spoken with her usual forcefulness, and she will know that I have found common ground with much of what she has said. I welcome her support for the broad direction of the Bill, and I also welcome her comments about the need for us to find a mechanism to support migrant women who are the victims of domestic abuse. I have said previously in this chamber, I have no doubt I will say it again, I vividly recall sitting round a table with my honourable friend the Minister, with the honourable member for Charnwood at that time in the Justice Department, with uh, the noble Baroness Williams, who I think was, is the victim's minister and Southall Black Sisters and other charities, and indeed the Honourable Lady opposite, who I always regard as an expert on these matters. There was consensus around the room that we have to find a way to treat the migrant victims of domestic abuse as victims first. I'm sure there are differences of opinion. There were differences of opinion in the room that day as to how we best do that. But I very much hope that the pilot projects of which my honourable friend have spoken will be able to provide us with the data that we need so we can find a long-term, enduring solution to how we can make sure that the victims of domestic abuse, who are here with no recourse to public funds, who are here perhaps on insecure immigration status, dependent upon their partner uh, for their right to be in the UK, we have to find a way to help them and to help them effectively. Whether it be the changes much needed, I have to say, uh, that are to be introduced to the family courts, and I welcome new clauses 16, 17 and 18, it is absolutely crucial that we find a way to make our court system support the victims of domestic abuse, that we find a mechanism where it supports the children who might otherwise uh, be obliged to come into contact with perpetrators, and I certainly welcome... Uh, the fact that we are moving to a position where the legal process will no longer be able to per perpetuate abuse. Um, but this is something that the Minister I know has worked hard on, and I welcome the changes that are brought forward. <coughs> I commend my honourable friend, the Minister, for having made such enormous progress. This has been a difficult passage for a bill much delayed, and I know that we are not there yet, but I sincerely hope that our honourable friends in the other place do not delay it much further, and I commend her for her very hard work today. Yeah. Robert Neil. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. This is a very important bill, and I warmly welcome it, and it deals with a number of what have hitherto been quite intractable uh, legal and social issues, uh, and it's to the Government's great credit, and I think to the credit of members on all sides, uh, that we've managed to find a practical way forward. 
to resolve a number of those otherwise intractable issues. Uh, like my honourable friend who has just spoken, I particularly welcome uh, the measures to bring uh, procedures in the family courts uh, in line with the protections which have existed for a long time in the criminal courts. That deficiency has been uh, a problem that has been recognised for a long time. It's been recognised by practitioners in the family courts, and indeed it's been recognised by many of the judiciary sitting in the family courts uh, as well. So we are right uh, to plug uh, that gap. Uh, I hope uh, the Minister will indicate that we will have the regulations, for example, setting out the specified offences uh, in relation uh, to uh, New Clause 17 as soon as possible, so, uh, so that there is clarity there. In rel relation to New Clause 18, a particularly important uh, provision, it seems to me, uh, is uh, that, uh, that uh, the, it's actually the new alternative uh, 85H that is added, section 85H which is added uh, in subsection 7, that the qualified legal representative appointed by the court uh, to carry out the cross-examination is not responsible to the party. That's necessary and deals with a very difficult situation where it may be that the party, uh, who, the abusive party, who was seeking to make the cross-examination, raises issues which need to be tested in the interest of justice by cross-examination of, of the uh, alleged victim or victim, but rightly should not be done so by the abuser, because they will continue the, the abuse. Therefore, the court appoints the advocate. Very important that we do stress that that advocate is, in effect, acting as a micus curiae. They are acting to assist the court and have no responsibility to the abusive party. And I hope, too, we will make clear that the regulations provided for, uh, for remuneration of those advocates are interpreted generously because those who assist the court in this way will be undertaking a particularly onerous and difficult task, uh, hampered, as they may very well often be, uh, by the hostility uh, of the abusive party uh, in the interest of justice of, whom, uh, of whose case uh, they have to test by cross-examination the case of the victim. That's a very difficult position that we are, out of social necessity, putting that advocate in, and they deserve to have the ability to be properly recompensed for the time that I suspect is likely to be required to do that job properly. But subject to those caveats, these are very welcome provisions. The abolition of, the, uh, of consent in uh, new clause uh, uh, three and three is particularly welcome. Uh, two, um, there's no doubt that the case of Brown settled the matter in large measure by a decision of the House of Lords, the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords, as it then was. But the law had been very difficult, going back to the case of Donovan in 1934, which stood uh, during the early days of my practice at the bar. And even within the Brown decision, uh, there was dissent within uh, the House of Lords, uh, and a number of the judgments in the Brown case suggested that the awkward interaction of social policy, the attempt to fit the regime with that of the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act, which hardly works for the type of pornographic videos and so on that we're seeing uh, uh, nowadays, which propagated some of this behaviour, uh, needed, if it were to be changed further, the intervention of Parliament. Not least because he also engages issues such as the right to privacy uh, under the European Convention. I think it's right that actually we act in the way that we do uh, to give uh, legislative clarity rather than placing the courts in the difficulty uh, of interpreting uh, that uh, area. Now, can I then turn, uh, if I may, to the point about acquired brain injury uh, that uh, uh, the Honourable Member for Rhonda makes? I'm not sure legislation is the way forward, but I know the Justice Committee, uh, in a number of our considerations, had noted uh, the fact that uh, it's only in recent years, perhaps, that the extent of pre-acquired brain injury uh, and the impacts that it can have within the justice system, both criminal, civil and family, has begun to be recognised. And further work and uh, research in this field would, I think, be a very welcome thing uh, in uh, any uh, event. Uh, in relation to the remaining matters... Uh, Proceedings under the Children Act and uh, New Clause 24. I listened with great care to the Honourable Lady, the, the Shadow Minister's uh, 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 case for this, and I'm very sympathetic. My only qualm is this uh, that uh, the 2014 Children and Families Act, Section 11, which set up the presumption of parental involvement, was regarded as progressive in its time. Now, we do know, and she's absolutely right, 
that there have been the most egregious and terrible cases of abuse of that presumption. But if we're going to change it, are we right to move from a presumption to an outright prohibition in a, classi- in a certain classification of case where, where the issue of abuse arises? I accept that. Or are we better to go perhaps to something like uh, a rebuttable presumption against access under those cases or supervision? I think that's the area that we need to have a proper debate, and that's why I, I welcome the thought that the panel recommends further consideration as how to get to where we, I think we all want to be uh, in, the best, uh, in the most legally watertight uh, and effective uh, measure. Uh, in, in relation to new clause 28, uh, I, I mention it. I rather agree with every great respect to the Honourable Lady for Kingston upon Hull North. I rather agree with my Honourable Friend, the Member for uh, Romsey and Southampton North formulation. Uh, and the only other issue I would raise from my experience as a criminal practitioner is, is this uh, that on more than one occasion uh, I found instances where part of the abuse had been to force uh, the victim to have an abortion. Uh, And uh, the irony is uh, that uh, reliance uh, upon a telephone call, uh, therefore to procure the means of doing that, uh, doesn't give the safeguard of knowing who is standing next uh, to the victim when she makes a telephone call. Uh, That's a a matter which certainly I have seen instances of, in effect, uh, in practice, and other criminal practitioners would. And that's why, although the intentions, I believe, are good uh, and well-meant, I would have a, a concern about moving down uh, this route as it's set out in in, uh, the new clause that's proposed uh, at uh, the moment. All in all, however, though, this is a good bill. There are good and constructive amendments. I hope that we'll be able to take them forward today, and I too express the hope that the other place will pass this swiftly, because it's a really major piece of reform that has been embarked upon here, uh, and for once the way that the House has uh, worked together to this, I think, ought to uh, bring credit uh, to uh, our system uh, and a consensual approach, for which I think we should all be very grateful. Yeah. 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 On to the five-minute limit. Dame Diana Johnson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I start by thanking the Minister for the very helpful and courteous way that she's navigated this bill uh, through the House over the years. And I was a member of the Draft Bill Committee and then of the Bill Committee that met just before the general election in 2019. And I've watched with interest as the bill has developed and no doubt, no doubt, and I mean no doubt, improved, and also the work of my own front bench and the tireless campaigning of the Shadow Minister, um, my honourable friend, the member for Yardley. Um, the issue that I want the House to consider today is one that hasn't been discussed before in all the hours of debate around domestic abuse, and it's arisen out of the COVID-19 pandemic and the steps the government have taken to ensure that women could access reproductive health care services during lockdown. And the government made very clear that that was going to be a temporary measure. It would be uh, revoked as soon as possible. And although the chair of the Women in Equalities Committee uh, chided me in her contribution for tabling new clause 28, I'm sure she will understand that the opportunities to raise these matters are very few and far between. And it certainly um, seems to me that uh, if you don't go fishing, you don't catch any fish. (laughs) So New Clause 28 is supported by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, the Royal College of Midwives, the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health, the British Society of Abortion Care Providers, BPAS, Mary Stokes, the End Violence Against Women Coalition and Women's Aid. Now, honourable members will be aware that current abortion law restricts the ability of healthcare professionals to provide care to women. The Abortion Act 1967 requires that abortion takes place on licensed premises. And what that means is that outside of COVID regulations, women have to attend a clinic or hospital to administer the first pill as part of an early medical abortion. This applies even if a woman is unable to safely attend a clinic because she is in an abusive relationship. Now, of of course, there are abortion clinics around the country, but they're not as local as GP surgeries or pharmacies. And it can mean, particularly for women in more rural areas, that they have to travel quite a distance to a licensed clinic. And this can be difficult for many women, but for women in abusive relationships, it can be impossible. For women who have to account for their time, their location, their spending, it simply is not possible to safely travel to an abortion clinic. Requiring a woman to attend at a clinic is not a clinical requirement. It is simply that because of the existing abortion law, 
Written in the 1960s, women in these circumstances are unable to access legal healthcare services unless they physically attend at a licensed premises. And of course, the basis of abortion law in England and Wales is criminalisation. If a woman ends her pregnancy without being in a licensed premises, such as by using pills bought online, she is committing a crime that carries a maximum life sentence under the Offences Against the Persons Act 1861, a law from over 150 years ago. The largest provider of online abortion pills estimates that one in five requests that they receive from Great Britain cite domestic abuse as the reason they cannot access legal abortion care. And of course we've already heard about problems of migrant women who um, cannot act, have no recourse to public funds. So new clause 28 would provide women in abusive relationships the ability to access safe legal abortion care without having to attend at a clinic. So if a doctor determines that the woman is in an abusive relationship and is unable to attend a clinic, she can obtain that appropriate care remotely. And for women in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy, this is currently available under the COVID limited regulations using telemedicine. Women are able to receive abortion medication at home. And as a result, illegal abortion, that is getting tablets off the internet, has all but disappeared. Instead, women are using this legal service and not at risking prosecution and criminalisation. So, but this is a temporary measure, and I am very pleased indeed that the Minister from the front bench uh, announced that there will be a public consultation. But I would ask the Minister uh, in the final remarks uh, at the end of this debate whether the Government would confirm that that public consultation will uh, not take place, will take place and the regulations will stay in place until the public consultation has taken place and the decision made because I think that would ensure that those women I'm most concerned about and other honourable members are concerned about can still access telemedicine and reproductive health care services uh, until a public consultation has been held. Thank you. Morton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This is a really good bill that's been made better by uh, scrutiny. And I pay tribute to Prime Ministers, Ministers, Shadow Ministers, past uh, and present, who have made such fantastic contributions to it. And the cross party working, I think it's demonstrated so ably through the uh, rough sex uh, defence, is a particular tribute to here. And I, I certainly pay my tribute to, to the Honourable Right Honourable Lady for Peck and my Honourable Friends for Wild Forest uh, and, uh, and Newbury. Um, but there are other good additions to this bill which haven't had that level of publicity. And I'll but talk to them before I reference my new clauses 35 and 36. I'm really pleased with new clause 15 that children have been put on the face of this uh, bill. We know uh, that about three quarters of uh, child safeguarding cases involve domestic abuse. I hope this bill will apply to all children and babies. No outside of definition, it needs to apply to unborn babies as well because Again, disgracefully, we know that something like a third of domestic abuse begins during a woman's um, pregnancy. And the impact that can have on the woman herself, of course, but then with the relationship with that baby and the stress levels that are caused are considerable and could be with that child throughout that child's whole um, lifetime. So New Clause 15 is really important uh, to view children as part of the equation the impact the perpetrator has on them, and to make sure that the support is available to help those children. And I do hope that the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, when she makes the community-based services uh, assessments, make sure that appropriate provision for children is included in that. I certainly support new clauses 16, 17 uh, and 18, hopefully countering the re-traumatising of victims in the court uh, environment, as we've done for rape cases uh, as well. And I've added my name to new clauses 32 and 33 with the Home Affairs Select Committee Chair. One item that's not included in the bill, which I did raise at second reading, and I do hope the Minister will take on board, is recognising suicides that are caused as a result of domestic um, abuse. It is really important that they are investigated properly as if it had been a domestic abuse homicide by the police, and it's recorded uh, as, uh, as such but I would be grateful if that could be looked at. Now, to come to my new clauses 35 and 36, they're not rocket science. New clause 35 is a duty to cooperate for children awaiting NHS um, treatment. Mr Deputy Speaker, 
Thank you to the domestic abuse charity uh, Hestia, one of the largest providers of uh, refuges in London and the South East, and its UK Says No More uh, campaign, which has been so powerful. 831,000 children, according to the Children's uh, Commissioner, are in households where there has been domestic abuse. About half the residents in refuges are children uh, themselves. The traumatic impact on children cannot be underestimated, particularly on their mental health in the short term, the medium term and the long term. And for those who have to flee home to go to refugees or out of area altogether, they should not lose out on timely access to healthcare services that they have relied on before the domestic abuse impact, as well as those that have resulted from it. Waiting lists and approved treatments can differ from one CCG group to the uh, next. So this is modelled, this amendment, on the priority access to military veterans under the Armed Forces Covenant for servicemen, servicewomen and their families when they move around the country. And it would maintain the place on children on waiting lists with the cooperation of various parts of the NHS. New Clause 36, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a similar principle for school uh, admissions. Local authorities have a duty to provide school places for looked-after children and adopted children as a priority. And it can be highly disruptive, as we know, when children are forced to leave their school. In this case, it can be all of a sudden, through no fault of their own, through domestic uh, abuse. So based on the principle that we apply to looked-after uh, children, it needs a simple revision by the Secretary of State for Education of the School's Admission Code. These two amendments, Mr Deputy Speaker, are simple but important measures to ensure that at such a traumatic time for children escaping domestic abuse, that their health and education should be impacted as little as possible. Finally, can I just comment on the uh, Honourable Lady for um, Hull North and her uh, abortion amendment, uh, New Clause uh, 28. As she knows, I have been supportive of the temporary measures. I have been supportive of the measures to uh, include uh, women from Northern Ireland to be able to access these services. But I do believe that this is a step too far, and it is the wrong uh, place. It makes something that is a temporary emergency provision uh, uh, long-term and uh, permanent. And as my honourable friend from the chair of the Justice Committee has said, it can have a detrimental impact on actually abusers forcing an abortion on their partner without the scrutiny of those clinicians. And on that basis, if the Honourable Lady does force this uh, to a vote, which I hope she doesn't, I will be voting against it. Vincent. Pleasure to follow uh, the right honourable gentleman and to participate uh, in this debate. And I just wish to take this opportunity to remind uh, members of published figures uh, just this week that indicate there has been a 15% rise in 999 or emergency calls mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland in the last three months during this pandemic on domestic abuse. 15% uh, rise on the uh, corresponding three months uh, of last year. So there is a pertinence to the debate that we are having uh, today at this time. Uh, and I know that. Given the contributions we have had over the last number of months and at different stages of this bill, there is a sincerity with which all members have approached uh, this bill, uh, not least the Minister, the Member for Louth and Horncastle, uh, and I, I praise her again um, for her efforts. It would be no surprise, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in previous uh, contributions I have recognised the importance of devolved government in Northern Ireland and indeed recognise that uh, in our devolved uh, legislature there is a separate and corresponding bill. Uh, but I have lamented the fact that that bill in Northern Ireland only tries to close the gap in domestic abuse legislation prior to this bill. And the progress of this bill will leave further glaring omissions within the legislative protection we have for abuse victims uh, in Northern Ireland. There will be no uh, statutory gender definition in our legislation. No provision of a domestic abuse commissioner or office in Northern Ireland. No reforms to our family courts and review of child contact. Uh, no changes outlined in this bill will be corresponded in Northern Ireland legislation uh, on housing, homelessness and refuges. Uh, no welfare policies additional within this bill applying in Northern Ireland to protect women and children and no protection for migrant services either. And I do hope that in the contributions today and in the passage of this bill, legislators in Northern Ireland take appropriate account of the progress and the changes that we are attaining here mm. in the House of Commons and recognise that those two are appropriate for further legislative passage and consideration uh, in Northern Ireland. The steps we are taking are good, but as through this bill, they do not go far enough uh, and they need to go further. No provision uh, of stalking in our legislation. No change to the fatal and non-fatal 
uh, non-fatal strangulation or uh, rough sex issues. And I do want to commend the Minister uh, for the work uh, and those involved uh, primarily in campaigning uh, on the rough sex uh, defence. I think it's an important uh, step forward. Uh, I know I'm going to be followed, Mr Deputy Speaker, by the Honourable Member for Shipley. Uh, and I do uh, think there are amendments uh, published in the Bill uh, that are very important. Uh, and I hope he will take the time uh, to outline the rationale behind providing legislative protection on parental alienation and recognising uh, that those are important issues that I hope will receive uh, support uh, within the House um, this afternoon. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, New Clause 28 has been mentioned, uh, and I, I, I do want to say that I agree with the comments that have been made uh, by the Honourable Lady for Romsey and Southampton North, and the Honourable, uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for Bromley uh, and Chislehurst. We are not normal, normally in the same place when it comes to issues uh, like this. Uh, but I think the rationale that they have outlined uh, at this time uh, with this bill are, are important considerations. Thank you, uh, colleague, for giving way, and, 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 and we all know my position on abortion as well. Does, it, does the honourable gentleman and friend agree with me that this attempt to add clause 28 to a bill which is designed to protect from harm is opportunistic and simply wrong, and that we can never support this whilst absolutely advocating for the need for changes in our domestic abuse legislation? I am very grateful to my honourable friend, uh, and I will agree with him in part, um, but I will say this uh, about the honourable lady uh, for Kingston upon Hull North. I have never found her contributions on issues like I do not agree with many of them, but I have never found her contributions on issues like this to be either provocative or offensive or sensationalist in the way that she presents them. Uh, I think she presents them uh, in a very uh, cogent way and in a sensitive way, albeit I doubt we will ever agree uh, on the issue um, at hand. Uh, but I, I, I do say, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I look forward to the contribution from the Honourable Lady uh, for Congleton. Uh, and I have said before that um, she embarks on Herculean efforts when it comes to the defence yeah, of yeah. life yeah. and the defence yeah, of the rights yeah. uh, of the unborn uh, child. And in the three amendments to New Clause 28, I think she highlights the frailties with New Clause 28 uh, itself. You can see them there clearly, amendments A, B and C, highlighting that there is no reference uh, to the nine-week, six-day time limit associated with the uh, coronavirus emergency provision of telemedicine uh, abortion. There is no reference to whether New Clause 28 applies to uh, medical terminations or surgical terminations. Uh, there is no reference, and nor was there in the contribution from the Honourable Lady uh, for Kingston, about the impact on victims of domestic abuse yeah. at home. The benefit of leaving that home and entering a clinical setting or engaging with the clinician to highlight not just the pregnancy that they are struggling with, but the issues of abuse that they are struggling with. No reference to the 7% of women within our country who procure abortions not because they want them, but as a result of coercive control. No reference to 7% of women who are forced to proceed and procure an abortion because of domestic abuse. Now, time won't allow for sufficient, and in fairness to the she wasn't in a position to outline the frailties associated with her own new clause uh, 28. I am grateful that in the contributions I've heard so far, I don't think the House will be minded to support new clause 28 today. Yeah, uh, and I will be very clear in my position that I could see no circumstances on which I could support New Clause 28 at all. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have uh, tabled 26 amendments to the Bill, so I have got about 10 seconds per uh, amendment. Uh, I would like to uh, put on record my thanks to the Minister for her consideration of my amendments. We, uh, we may not have ended up in total agreement on them, but I do appreciate the time she spent engaging with me on them. My amendments are simply about trying to make sure we protect all victims of domestic abuse. And I have had many, many conversations with men and women on this subject, agreeing wholeheartedly with what I am trying to achieve. I think most people understand that both men and women can be and are victims of domestic abuse, and men and women can be and are perpetrators of domestic abuse. There are those who are seeking to claim that domestic violence is a gendered crime, i.e. that it is a crime done by men to women. Not only is this insulting to the male victims of domestic violence 
and ignores gay and lesbian victims of domestic abuse too. It's also utter rubbish. For example, a woman in a lesbian relationship, according to the official figures, is one and a half times more likely to be a victim of domestic abuse from her partner than a woman in a heterosexual relationship. Uh, Two-thirds of victims of domestic abuse are women, and one-third are men, according to the Office of National Statistics. Um, As it happens, two-thirds of people who are murdered are men, two-thirds of people who take their own life are men. Does anybody seriously want to stand up and say that we should ignore the one-third of women who are victims of murder or take their own life simply because they're in a minority? Of course not. And the same shouldn't apply when it comes to domestic violence too. Being a male victim of domestic violence should not be less important or more important than being a female victim. Of course I'll give way to my honourable friend. Thank my honourable friend for giving way and I'm listening very carefully to his amendments and also I read them through very carefully. I'm not clear though which aspect of the bill he's, he's disagreeing with because of course this bill is covering every victim of domestic violence. So what changes does he want to see on the face of the bill? Well, my honourable friend makes a fair point, but the, unfortunately it's not, it's not actually quite as it seems. There are references into the bill that uh, the, the government, it says in the bill that government should take note of the fact uh, and that services <coughs> should be provided on the basis that women are more likely to be a victim than a man. It should be irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether the victim is a male or a female. It's completely irrelevant and we should take out any kind of that kind of reference to the bill. The bill should be gender neutral. That's the point. I'm trying to make. In the t- rest of the time al- allowed, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to particularly focus on my Amendment 24, uh, which is about classing parental alienation uh, as, a, as domestic abuse, and also where a parent deliberately prevents the other parent from having contact with their child or children for no good reason. There are thousands of mums and dads, hundreds of thousands of mums and dads grandmas and granddads who don't have any relationship with their children at all, simply because one parent has deliberately and for no good reason turned their child against the other parent. I think they'll find it quite extraordinary that all the main political parties are trying to block parental alienation being on the face of the bill as a criminal offence as domestic abuse. Parliament is failing those people, but I will keep speaking up for them. This is simply cruel, not just for the parent deprived of access and the grandparents deprived of access, but for the children too. And it should be quite clearly classed as domestic abuse if it is done without any good reason at all. I would like to say that I'm very grateful to the Minister for including parental alienation and preventing contact with children as examples of domestic abuse in the recently released draft of the statutory guidance which goes alongside this bill. I would have liked to have seen this in the bill itself, but I do believe that this is a momentous development as it means that when considering domestic abuse, parental alienation and preventing contact are now specific examples that the government have highlighted in their guidance. Those individuals, including those men and women who have written to me with their distressing personal experiences, who are clearly suffering now have a message from the government that what they are experiencing is clearly abuse. And I very much hope that this will be of significant comfort to those who currently feel completely helpless in these situations. With regard to the other uh, amendments uh, I've uh, taken, I just want to highlight one in particular in the time I've got left, Mr Deputy Speaker, which is about lie detector tests, which haven't come up in the rest of the debate. Um, My Amendment 26 would remove the use of lie detector tests. Uh, I'm on the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee that did an inquiry into the Jeremy Kyle show. Uh, Many people in this House reviled Jeremy Kyle because he was using lie detector tests on his programme and people were pointing out that they are not reliable, that they come up with dodgy results. Uh, It seems extraordinary that the same people who were pointing out that it was outrageous for Jeremy Kyle to use lie detector tests in an entertainment programme because they weren't reliable, would support using lie detector tests in something as serious as this, when clearly those tests are still just as unreliable as they were in his case. 
So I would like to see the evidence that says that these tests are accurate and justifies their use, which will presumably exonerate Jeremy Kyle, by the way, Mr Deputy Speaker, or otherwise we should not be touching them with a barge pole. And I look forward to hearing the evidence that the Government have got uh, to support the use of lie detector tests. But the main important message for me tonight, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that parental alienation is and should be yeah. domestic abuse. Tonya and Tony Alzi. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's um, not a particularly a pleasure to be following the Honourable Member from Shifley, um, who talks about the alienation of fathers and grandparents when the Family Court continues to give parental rights and has done to men who have perpetrated violent crimes against their children. And I find it absolutely disgusting. But the ongoing COVID pandemic has shone a light on the paucity of services available to victims of domestic violence. Funding for services has been decimated since 2010, and this has been shown time and time again, with mainly women and children finding themselves homeless and unsupported after falling victim to domestic abuse. That is why this bill is welcome, and has been, even though it has been a long time coming. At its heart, this bill must be about providing services to people who have become victims of abuse by their partner, regardless of their gender. And we know that it is mainly women who suffer from domestic abuse, be it physical violence, threatening behaviour or coercive control. And the consequence of this could be an unwanted pregnancy. Throughout lockdown, access to telemedicine has meant that illegal and highly unsafe abortion has almost completely disappeared across Great Britain. And that's why I fully support my honourable friend from Hull North's new clause 28. It makes sure that women in abusive relationships are able to access care in a way that doesn't put them in danger. Abortion is essential health care, and many women in abusive relationships will seek to end a pregnancy without their partner's knowledge. The current law puts these women in danger, and this situation can, cannot continue. And I welcome the Minister's uh, mention this evening of a public consultation. This amendment would not change the underlying law on abortion. It would not change the time limit. It would not change the many health care laws and regulations that govern abortion. It would simply enable the most vulnerable of women to access the care they need without the threat of prosecution. Prosecutions must be brought where there is a defence of rough sex where it is invoked. There can never be consent where someone dies. Never. And I must con commend the work of my right honourable friend from Camberwell and Peckham on this matter. Protection for women killed by men who claim that consent was granted is surely one of the most basic rights and we should pass this into law. Measures that make it clear that this will not be tolerated. But speaking out of one's experience of domestic violence is a very, very brave thing to do. A fear of reprisal stops many from speaking out, which is why I would also like to pay tribute to my honourable friend from Canterbury, who found coming to the Chamber too difficult to speak this evening. Many of the measures in this Bill are welcome, but there is such a hill to climb, and we need to keep on protecting victims and their children. And not just victims of domestic abuse, but making sure we provide a safe and fair family court system and that our justice system protects those who have been subjected to sexual assault. The overhaul of the family court for domestic abuse victims will transform so many lives and for many of those I have represented. And I welcome that the Government has committed to amend the Bill so that victims of domestic abuse will automatically be eligible for special measures in the family court. I have been dealing with a young woman who was groomed and raped at age 15 by a man many years her senior. Her case wasn't taken seriously, and even though the perpetrator admitted in a police interview what he had done, they didn't take it any further. Now, a few years on, this man has been sentenced to prison and is serving on the Sex Offenders Register. But my constituent has suffered the most appalling neglect and lack of support in bringing this case. So much so, she feels worse for doing it. No victim of any crime should ever be made to feel such regret. And this is not an isolated incident. We have all dealt with cases where women have not been believed and where children have been put in danger. You cannot provide services to people who need them without proper funding. 
Without funding, people fall through the cracks, and for far too long, too many have fallen through these cracks and have been let down. Mr Deputy Speaker, we cannot let this continue, and on both sides of the House, I think we agree on that. Maria Miller. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We are dealing with very, very serious issues here, but I have to say to the House, at times the passage of this bill has felt a little bit like the running of the Grand National, whether it is Brexit getting in the way, or whether it is general elections, or now, most recently, COVID-19. I think the ministers sitting on the front bench um, have to get an award for resilience in taking forward this bill. Um, and we need to, in all seriousness, Mr Deputy Speaker, make sure that this bill does not fall at the last hurdle. And I'm not sure that speech is Brooke, but anyway, the last hurdle. <laughs> because we have to resist the temptation to make this a Christmas tree bill, yes. to try and put in so many things which we feel strongly about yeah. that it actually falls, not maybe at this place, but when it goes to the other end of the corridor, yeah. to the other place. Because uh, the Honourable, my right honourable friend, the member to, for Maidenhead, was right when she said we have to make sure this bill is the best shape it can be. And I'm very pleased that the Minister listened very carefully, perhaps not just to the Labour front bench, but to the joint committee that I chaired that looked at the evidence that was put forward for the first draft of this bill and agreed to make fundamental changes in new clause 15 um, around including the uh, impact on children of domestic violence uh, in new clauses 16 and 17, recommendations that we made with regards to special measures in the family court proceedings, and indeed the recommendations that the Joint Committee made, uh, which are now reflected in new clause 18, around blocking cross-examination of victims by alleged perpetrators. I think that is incredibly important cross-party working and shows that joint committees can add considerable value to the progress of bills such as this. Um, I would also like to pay tribute to the, Minister for, the Ministers for continuing to listen um, and for um, acting so swiftly on new clause 20 around rough sex. And my honourable uh, friend, the member for Wire Forest, uh, the right honourable lady for Peckham, and our new uh, friend from Newbury for all of the very hard work that they've done in, in bringing this to fruition in such a short period of time. But in common with my right honourable friend, the member for uh, Romsey and Southampton North, I agree that there is, um, whilst there is room for changes such as uh, inclusion of new clause 20, this is not the point in time to address the issues, the very serious issues, that the Right Honourable Lady, the member for um, Kingston-upon-Hull, has raised in her new clause 28. Because I, I think the rushed nature of this um, has left us with a clause which is open to a great deal of misinterpretation. And knowing the Honourable Lady's incredibly honourable intentions in raising this issue, um, it, it, the new Clause 28 really does not do her, the, what she's saying justice. Um, and indeed, I, I, I couldn't possibly support it if she were to bring it to a vote, because without actually my honourable friend, the member for Congleton's um, amendments, it would run the very serious risk of um, exposing some of the most vulnerable members of our society, people who have been victims of domestic abuse, um, to something which would be, to all intents and purposes, an unregulated abortion service, which I know is not her intention. Of course. Point. I, I'm just a little concerned with what the Honourable Lady said then, because, of course, um, we have the Abortion Act 1967 and a whole plethora of regulations and professional standards. So even at the moment, with the telehealth medicine that's in place, it is governed by regulation and uh, legislation. I wouldn't want anyone to think that wasn't the case. Um, and I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention, but of course she will be encouraging people to undertake abortions outside of regulated premises, which I think is not necessarily her intention, but it's the way that the amendment could be interpreted. Mr Deputy Speaker, I wanted to just go on to a couple of uh, issues which I think the front bench still need to consider, and the first of which is the issue of migrant women. Um, so many organisations have ra raised this as a continuing concern. Um, equally, I am concerned that there is a lack of evidence on which the government can base a more concrete uh, solution. 
I'm pleased the government's announced a pilot for one point. Well, I'm pleased they've announced a fund for 1.5 million pounds to support uh, safe accommodation for migrant wim- women. What I'm not pleased about is that it is yet another pilot, because pilots have a tendency to go on and then we have elections and then nothing really changes. So can my honourable friend, the Minister, or indeed whoever is uh, summing up for the Government here today, um, go into a little bit more detail on on that? Uh, In committee, the Minister touched upon the use of the National Referral Mechanism for Victims of Trafficking as a possible concrete route forward. Is that something which uh, could be scaled to deal with this and how would victims access it and equally I'm concerned that nobody today has brought up the issue of um, information sharing Uh, I know the government is currently undertaking or being subject to a judicial review there are issues around that can the minister update the house um, once those matters are cleared up uh, what will happen on that and also whether the Istanbul convention will actually be able to be ratified as a result of this Hidden abuse is an ongoing issue. I hope the Minister will be listening to my and other comments on particularly elder abuse. Collecting data is so important for this group. Uh, Can the Minister confirm that that will be happening? Um, And then last but by no means least, can I support my right honourable friend, the member for Romsey, on her new Clause 34 uh, with regards to the publishing of sexual images without consent. This builds on the work that was done by myself and other members around revenge pornography. Um, And I hope that once the Law Commission reports, the Government will bring in the online harms bill long overdue to make sure these sorts of measures are put into law once and for all. Thank you. Mark Garnier. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I was a bit earlier than I was expecting, actually. Um, Mr Speaker, I'd, I'd rise to speak to uh, the new clauses uh, 4 to 11 in my name and those of the Right Honourable Member for Pegham and Campbell, and also to the Government new clause 20. Um, and of course, as we're all familiar, this refers to the case of Natalie Conley, my constituent, who, was, um, who died tragically in 2016 at the hands of John Broadhurst, uh, an individual who then used the rough sex defence to... Um, uh, in order to try and reduce his sentence. And to be absolutely clear, I was overhearing a conversation with my two colleagues next door. This is not about trying to stop people from engaging in BDSM if that's what they choose to do. This is about using the rough sex defence to try to lessen a charge uh, against an individual. And the tragedy with Natalie Connolly was that this was an individual who was a perfectly normal person. She wasn't into this type of thing. But she entered into a relationship with a man who serially abused her by coercing her into this type of rough sex. And then eventually, during an appalling afternoon, ended up killing her her in a most brutal and intimate way, the details of which are available and, and, and tragic to read. The problem with this is that not only was Natalie not into this, not only had she been coerced into this, but actually the whole... the whole conversation about this case resulted in Natalie Connolly's name being associated with rough sex. And I was trying to work out a good way of trying to put across actually how vile this is. And actually the member for Birmingham Yardley in her opening remarks was incredibly sensitive and really, really summed this up. Because the reality of it is is she was a victim of abuse and she was a victim of a flawed legal system. I got an email from Natalie's father, Alan Andrews, a couple of days ago basically talking about this. And I'll read some parts of it, um, but it's a incredibly moving email. There is no way that a man should be able to bat away brutal sex violence as just an accident and pave the way to get away with it. To cope with her private life being explored in intricate detail on top of the grief of losing her has been unimaginably hard for the whole family. Natalie is no longer here to tell us what he did to her or why he left her where he did. One thing is for certain, Natalie didn't fantasise about being killed or leaving her daughter without a mum that night. And part of the problem with this, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that when Natalie's daughter, Madison, starts Googling when she gets a bit older about her mother, what we don't want for her to do is to come along and find all these stories about her mother was being described as into this. But what we do want to do is for Madison to look on her mother with immense pride and say that as a result of my mother's death, thousands of women are now protected against this type of violence. And that is why this is so incredibly important. And I just have to say, you know, I'm so grateful to all of those people who have been involved in this. The, the amendments that were put forward by, uh, by the mother of the House and myself um, 
and co-signed by 70 MPs across, across the, uh, both sides. Basically, look at the rough sex defence. It looks at the review from the Director of Public Prosecution in, in the event of a, of, a, of, a, of a charge being reduced. It looks at uh, the anonymity of the victim, and also it looks at something else which is peculiar to modern Britain, where people spend too much time perhaps looking at a different type of pornography online than perhaps was available many years ago. But the important point is, is that we can't address all of these. Some of these are quite complex legal issues, and I know, you know that they are sort of beyond certainly someone like me, but not by my colleagues, in order to try to find an answer to this. But what I am convinced about is that the government has come up with a solution to this, the new Clause 20, that absolutely addresses these issues, either directly through the, through the new Clause 20, directly addressing the, uh, the rough sex defence, or obliquely through therefore making it less important to have an specific anonymity for the victims, because this will remove the need for that. So I am really grateful to, 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 to where the government has moved on this. And I think I also would like to just say a few specific thank yous to, um, uh, to, to, to some people for this. Um, my new, well, uh, new friend, a member from Newbury, has provided a simpleton like me with extraordinary insight into, into the legal process, um, the like of which people like me really do need. And, you know, she was an incredibly important new member to this House. Also, the two ministers on the front bench, the Honourable Member for Louth and Horncastle and the Honourable Member for Cheltenham, they, two of them have been absolute rock stars when it comes to this, in terms of the incredible hard work that they've done, and particularly the member for Love and Horncastle. Um, yes, please. Thank you. I just wanted to thank him in order that he could continue thanking people. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I, I am conscious that there's a lot of, a lot of people. But as I say, the, the member for Love and Horncastle came to, to Kidderminster to come and meet with Natalie's family. This was not a visit to tweet about afterwards. It was not a visit to put out a, a press release. It was an incredibly private meeting with a grieving family to actually find out what the effects are of this appalling killing of poor Natalie Connolly. And it was, a, a, you know, frankly, an extraordinary afternoon getting together. And I'm so grateful to her for, for, for taking the trouble and all the work she's done with her colleague from Cheltenham in, in exactly the same way. Um, the Prime Minister's been involved in this. The Justice Secretary's worked incredibly hard but I have to say, you know, in this House, it's, we all know it's an extraordinary privilege to be members of Parliament and to represent our constituents. But it's also an extraordinary privilege to be able to work with actually quite remarkable, uh, extraordinary long-term parliamentarians. And I have to say, working with the, memorable, the, the member for, for Campbell and Peckham has been an experience which, the like of which I've rarely had. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a privilege, not a, not a peculiar experience. But, uh, but it is remarkable when you come across somebody yes. who has worked so hard for so many years, standing up for women's rights, and with some extraordinary achievements, to be able to work with it has been truly remarkable. Thank you. Ms. Cavill Roberts. And it is truly an honour to follow the, the Honourable Member for the Wire Forest and the work that he has done in, in preventing, bringing ahead the prevention of the rough sex defence alongside the uh, Honourable Member for Campbell and Peckham. And I'd first like to take the opportunity to welcome many of the Government's new clauses and, and to pay tribute to members across the House who have worked constructively during the Bill Committee and previously on the Joint Committee to achieve this. Deputy Speaker, thanks to their efforts, the Bill now includes many landmark changes, frankly too many for me to list in the time that I have, but uh, and, and really that, that, that it is a pleasure for once to be standing on this side and to welcome so many of them. And I'm sure that the whole House will, will join me in that respect in, in commending the, um, the outcome of what is and what has been effective cross-party cooperation. In this spirit, I would urge the Government to take unequivocal action to guarantee that all victims of domestic abuse will be treated equally and afford them the same support and resources, regardless of their immigration status. We were talking earlier on about the, the evidence gap in relation to, to, to some victims and how the, the potential of lifting the no recourse to public funds rule temporarily might well provide evidence as required to address the, that evidence gap, which seems to hamper the pilot project at pre present. Certainly, how to find exactly who to target seems to be an issue in this request. And I would also add my voice to, to the call for further updates, especially in what way the, the pilot scheme might achieve the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, which I would believe everybody here would very much welcome. 
I therefore urge the Government to support new clauses 22, 23, 26 and 27, which call for special attention to be paid to the exceptional circumstances migrant women face. I turn now to Amendment 46 in my name, which seeks to ensure that a representative for Wales would hold a seat on the Commissioner's Advisory Board to reflect the particular circumstances faced by women in Wales. Many of the services aimed at preventing and supporting people affected by domestic abuse are, of course, devolved, whether relating to health care, housing or, or social services. Specific Welsh legislation exists in the form of the Violence Against Women, Domestic Abuse and Sex and Sexual Violence Wales Act 2015. Much of the funding arrangements are already also devolved in Wales. Now, throughout, of course, what is important and what is important with the role of the Commissioner is that the voice of victims of domestic abuse is heard. And what I fear is that the voice of the victims of domestic abuse in Wales will not be represented as things stand. And it is important to remember that there are people who are experiencing at present the jagged edge of legislation, which will hold on course until Wales gains full legal jurisdiction. Now, although the designated Domestic Abuse Commissioner has already done excellent work in cooperating with organisations in Wales, and I commend Ms Jacobs for her hard work and her keen interest in the specific circumstances faced by Welsh woman, women, I would beg the Ministers to consider that this amendment would safeguard this relationship into the future rather than being one on voluntary grounds. And finally, I would like to speak to my new Clause 21. This new clause calls for the creation of a domestic abuse register to ensure that greater protection is provided for potential victims of domestic abuse from individuals who have a track record of abusive behaviour within relationship and whose potential for repeat violent actions warrants proactive intervention. A domestic abuse register, user's register would provide the incentive for a shift in focus away from reacting to domestic abuse towards a preventative approach. We know repeat offending by perpetrators with violent and controlling histories of abuse is common. Data provided by the Metropolitan Police to the London Assembly as part of the Assembly's domestic abuse report showed that in the year up to September 2019 there were 13,600 repeat victims of domestic abuse and 21% of cases dis discussed at Marek's multi-agency multi risk assessment conferences 21% of those cases discussed in 2018 were repeat cases. One concern raised during the committee stage of the bill regarding the domestic abuse register was the consequential increased bureaucratic burden that this might place on police forces. Although I would argue that cross-force technology offers opportunities, I would respond in the spirit of compromise and urge the Government to support new Clause 33 a table by the Right Honourable Lady for, for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford as a way of improving the current situation in a similar spirit or even new clause 32. We must take this opportunity now to ensure that the Domestic Abuse Bill includes life-saving measures to protect all victims of abuse, recognising predictable perpetrator behaviour and addressing it is key to this Bill's future success. Lee. I want to speak, if I may, on um, New Clause 28, and I thought that a consultant who wrote to me summed it up very well when he said that, the, of course, we recognise that the bill is important in view of widespread psychological, physical and emotional and sexual abuse of women, which we all share. Amendment to New Clause 28 is entitled to enabling access to abortion and abusive relationships. This will be the effect of this amendment, which will lead the way to coerce coercive abortions within the concept of abusive relationships. Uh, from a clinical perspective, I cannot understand how there would be any confidence in detecting an abusive relationship on the basis of a telephone conversation or audiovisual interview. How can the clinician distinguish between a false claim of abuse in order for the women to access a home abortion and a genuinely abusive relationship in which the woman might well be coerced into having an abortion by a partner or other family members. As a consultant, and I stress I'm reading this, it's not my argument, it's the consultant's arguments, I would, and I'm quoting, take a, any abusive relationship very seriously as it may directly impact upon patient welfare and raise important safeguarding issues. Indeed, what would be the situation if the doctor believes in, quote, good faith that a home abortion, quote, is being forced on the woman as a result of an abusive relationship with the father. 
The presumption behind the new clause is that the woman wants an abortion but is prevented from proceeding because of the abusive relationship. However, it is likely that in the context of an abusive relationship that she is being forced to have the abortion by her partner. New Clause 28 would enable access to such coercive or forced abortion in abusive relationships. So I think that's a very clear argument from a consultant working in the field about the dangers of New Clause 28. There's also quite a lot which is unclear about New Clause 28, whether you could have abortions anywhere, whether they would, the uh, unborn child would have to be of a certain gestational age. So that's why it's important that the amendments of my Honourable Friend of Congleton have put down that there should be an, a proper inquiry before the temporary order is made perfect, and I think the Government shares this point of view. It really indicates, and I think all these arguments indicate, that since these changes have occurred, we have not had the time or the means to properly scrutinise the consequences of these changes. Such consequences have included women suffering from severe complications and a woman afraid to phone for advice for after experiencing severe complications due to a controlling partner. Perhaps most importantly, the at-home abortion policy could result in more women being coerced into unwanted abortions. As Dr Gregory Gardner, GP and honorary clinical lecturer at the University of Birmingham highlighted in a witness statement, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to verify by phone or video whether a woman is undergoing any kind of duress to have an abortion. There does not seem to have been any consideration given to this in the proposed change of policy. There will be women who need delicate counselling to discover coercion or other forms of abuse. His testimony highlights that if we pass this new clause, we will go against the very aims of this bill, as a phone call often fails to illustrate if a woman is in a domestic abuse situation. Yeah. I wonder if he does not agree with the government funding telephone lines for domestic abuse, if it's so difficult to take advice and give advice to women in a domestic abuse situation over the telephone. It was designed by the government as a very temporary measure. I don't think for a moment that it was designed as a permanent measure. It was designed just simply in the context of COVID-19. Because I would have thought that body language, visual signs, cannot be observed over the telephone. It's not a perfect way of consulting. Already, uh, there are investigations of nine cases where pills issued via telephone were taken beyond the recommended, recommended gestation. This is less than two months after the service commenced. In one case, the abortion took place between 18 weeks over the legal limit of nine weeks and six days. We've also seen the media give, of course, better attention to domestic abuse, and this increase in visibility may have given victims greater strength to come forward. That's good. But the very gravity of women being cursed into abortion does not seem to have been given, uh, taken as seriously as it should be. It seems obvious to me that a woman seeking an abortion or a duress may be being observed by abusive partners or otherwise are acting in fear and it will be less likely to come forward and disclose abuse. So again, other doctors, we could quote them again and again, there's not enough time, but one said to me this proposed amendment would place doctors in a very risky situation. Deciding whether a patient might be in an abusive situation by one telemedicine consultation would be almost impossible in reply to that. Assessment of women at risk of domestic abuse, another doctor said, should be part of a comprehensive safeguarding strategy. It should not be left to a single doctor working under time pressure via the medium of telemedicine. I know that there are strong views, and I respect the position of the Honourable Member for Hull North. We would never agree. But this, frankly, is lazy legislating. It is an abuse of parliamentary procedure. Abortion is such an important issue that we need to have a serious debate around it. We in the pro-life lobby recognise that we're never going to change the fact that if you want to get an abortion, you will get an abortion. But we would never give up arguing the importance of this issue, of the value of all life, however frail, and the dignity of all human beings. We consider it a vitally important issue. It should be dealt properly by Parliament. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a, it's a pleasure to honour to follow the Honourable Member for Gainsborough. In fact, it's a pleasure to have reached this stage in this journey with this bill. As the Minister referred to earlier, it has been 
in some ways a very collegiate experience. Uh, also, the, the Honourable Member for Birmingham Yardley referred to that, and it's certainly something I felt about the, the committee. Perhaps that has been because it's a journey which we all appreciate will be life-changing for the hundreds of thousands of women, particularly in this country, who every year face domestic abuse. And if there's one message that we all want to go out from this place today, it will be that we will accept no excuse for domestic abuse against anyone, whether it's physical, emotional or financial. It will simply not be tolerated. In the time I've been involved in this bill, I'm happy to acknowledge that the Government has moved its position in several significant ways, and I'm particularly pleased to see children included now in the face of the bill, because we all recognise the impact that domestic abuse can have on them. Um, I also um, acknowledge the fact that the Government has um, listened to calls from the Liberal Democrats to improve protection of abuse survivors in family courts where often perpetrators have been able to continue to coerce and control the person they have abused. However, there are still significant changes that many of us in this House would like to see. I'll come on to, to migrant women in a moment. But we would also want to strengthen support available from local authorities, measures to support teenagers involved in relationships uh, which are abusive. But as I said, most importantly before us today, the amendments particularly relating to migrant women who encounter domestic abuse that could enable the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, which is now eight years and more since um, this country signed. On that, I would specifically like to mention new clauses 26 and 27. I am mindful of the, the Minister's comments on supporting the, the Support for Migrant Women scheme, and I look forward to seeing um, that uh, come to fruition. But clause, new clause 26 would give migrant women who survived domestic abuse the right to remain in this country. And I note today that the Government... Um, did say in their letter that they did not believe a blanket proposal was appropriate. But as Amnesty International points out, expanding the domestic violence rule to offer leave to remain to all survivors is by far the simplest and surest way to stop anyone falling through the cracks, which in COVID-19 we have seen it's all too easy for people to do regardless of the good intentions. The other, other relevant clause, clause, indeed, I would mention, is number 27, which would prevent the sharing of data between government agencies, such as the police and the Home Office, and reassure those afraid to come forward and report violent and unacceptable abuse for fear that their immigration status might be investigated and they could ultimately be deported. How can we help people? What will it matter what steps we put in place to support them when, if they come forward, they are, too, they are too afraid to come forward in the first place. Surely we must offer those facing the most horrific of personal circumstances the comfort and security of knowing they will be helped unconditionally. Numerous charities, uh, such as um, Southall Black Sisters, End Violence Against Women, so, and numerous other organisations, have called for these measures. And we heard heartbreaking evidence of the, on the Bill Committee from a woman who had come here from Brazil, only to find herself eight years later facing the most difficult of situations because of domestic abuse. I believe this bill can change that, and that all survivors of domestic abuse, regardless of where they come from or who they are, must have the same protection in law. But there is one other vital issue, and that is misogyny as a hate crime. An amendment in the name of Stella Creasy, which I have supported through the passage of this bill. The reason is simple for me. If we are truly to tackle domestic abuse effectively, not just respond after the fact, but prevent it in the first place, we have to understand where it comes from. That's the aim of Amendment 35 in requiring police to record and act on offences that are motivated by misogyny, a hatred and disregard for women. It has been in place in Nottinghamshire since 2016, and their campaigners say the approach has given women the confidence to report abuse. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, in commending uh, these various amendments to the House, I would also like to pay tribute to the Right Honourable Member from Maidenhead and hope that when we conclude these proceedings, she is happy with what we have done with the bill she first brought forward. The Owner Bruce. Thank you. I support this landmark bill and the Government's amendments to it. 
I wish to speak to new clause 1 in my name and new clause 28 and my amendments to it. In 2018, the Select Committee for Women and Equalities concluded there is significant research suggesting there is a relationship between the consumption of pornography and sexually aggressive behaviours. And the Minister has rightly said that the rough sex defence is unconscionable. In light of recent survey evidence showing a clear link between rough sex and the influence of pornography, I put down new clause 1, both to ask the Government to investigate this further and also to highlight that there is an urgent need for action to be taken by Government to tackle pornography concerns more widely, such as addiction, and to protect children both from seeing it and being forced to be engaged within it. What I'm seeking from the Ministry in putting new clause 1 forward and I, like others, appreciate the fact she ha- I have found her a listening minister during the progress of this bill. I'm seeking an assurance that Government will now take early steps to tackle concerns about harm from pornography so that I do not have to press New Clause 1 to a vote. Turning now to New Clause 28, I cannot put the key objections to this clause better than a response I obtained from a female GP. It's long, but worth repeating. She says... I am very concerned about the proposed changes to new clause 28. It is extraordinary that it should be argued that a woman suffering or at risk of domestic abuse seeking abortion should somehow be considered to be at less risk if she consults a doctor remotely by telemedicine and is given abortive thanks to take at home. Where is the opportunity to check with her privately that she is not being coerced or that she may be in danger? to examine her, to determine her stage of pregnancy, to offer her support and clear advice in a place of safety. As a medical practitioner working remotely, how can I reliably ensure she is at the stage of pregnancy she says she is? As the use of abortive accounts used later than the nine weeks, six days limit carries a greater risk of complications, which I would be responsible for providing care for. And how can I provide assurance that this woman is suffering from domestic abuse unless it has been previously disclosed to me? These factors are virtually impossible to verify without a face-to-face consultation. Yes. Thank you, the Honourable Lady for Congress and, and all she does in this House for, uh, for preserving life in, in, in every sense of the word. In context where Article 39 of the Istanbul Convention highlights the need to counter coercive abortion, does the Honourable Lady agree the proposal to allow women in domestic abuse situations unique permanent access to medical abortion without needing to leave their abusive environment for a physical consultation is nothing if not seriously misplaced, which is why in Honourable Lady's amendments A, B and C for uh, Clause 28 are very appropriate. Thank you. I will come on to that. Um, thank the Honourable Member for his contribution. Um, a quote from someone else who works regularly with victims of domestic abuse. She says, This proposal in reality is actually a gift to male abusers who want their partners yeah. to abort. This clause will not help abused women. It could put them in a worse position. And it is dysfunctional. And that's why I put down the amendments I did to new clause 28, A, B and C, to illustrate that fact. And I do want to thank the Honourable Members for Belfast East, Basingstoke and Gainsborough for underlining and accepting this. Uh, Amendment A, that there's no 10-week gestation limit, which is potentially dangerous. Amendment B, that this potentially would include surgical abortions outside clinically approved settings, similarly concerning, and C, that it's vital that there is some sort of review of the current emergency legislation before any extension of this legislation is brought forward. And I thank the Minister for her proposal for consultation. Would she confirm that this will be a proper inquiry? <coughs> Minister. I'm extremely uh, grateful to my honourable friend, and uh, I, I am pleased to confirm, and I emphasise, of course, that the Government is uh, neutral on the very sensitive topic of abortion. But I hope that she and uh, others across the House who hold a range of views, genuine views, on this topic will take comfort from the fact that the Government intends to launch the public consultation as I outlined in my earlier intervention. And I thank her for her work. Thank the Minister for that. And um, on that basis, I, I won't be pressing Amendment C to a vote and nor will I be pressing amendments A and B because I think they've achieved their purpose which was to point out the flaws of new clause 28. 
Now, the Speaker has already quite rightly, for constitutional reasons, ruled out new clause 29 as out of scope. This is a domestic abuse bill. It should not be hijacked by those continuously campaigning on another issue and constantly looking for opportunities in this place to add badly worded amendments onto bills with unforeseen implications and complications. We have already seen this with the Northern Ireland Emergency Powers Bill, the outcome of such an approach, and this House should, I hope, be very wary of repeating that again. I support this Bill. I support the Government's endeavours to tackle domestic abuse. Let us ensure that is the focus of this Bill. Chris Bryant. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is what happens all too often. A man, and it is normally a man, uh, comes home, perhaps he's drunk, um, or he loses his temper, or he quietly and dispassionately decides to deal with his partner, to teach her a lesson, perhaps to slap her around a bit. Maybe he lashes out with a punch to the face, or he shakes her violently, repeatedly and at length, or he strangles her, or he pushes her down the stairs. I've heard of men slamming their partner's head against the wall, against the door, against a bathroom cabinet, against a toilet bowl, against the kitchen worktop and against the oven. These are horrific instances. And in many, many cases, there is absolutely no visible wound or even a bruise. But the damage is invisible, internal, inside the brain. And that internal damage can last for years. Um, The woman, and it is normally a woman, um, may suffer from anxiety, depression, expressly because of the injury to her brain. She may suffer from memory loss. She may be more confused. Her language, her speaking, may often be slurred because of the brain injury. Um, And many may doubt her in the criminal justice system because she is confused and she finds it difficult to turn up to events on time because she's lost some of her executive functions. And she may suffer from terrible fatigue, which is a very common aspect of brain injury. And it's almost certain that she won't have gone to the doctor about it, either because she has a coercive partner who won't let her, or because she's frightened of talking to anybody about the domestic abuse that she suffered, or because actually she doesn't realise that a brain injury can do as much damage as any other kind of injury. Depressingly, we have very little idea of how common this is in the country. There's been remarkably little um, research done, which is why my amendments, which are tiny little amendments just seek to redress that balance a tiny little bit. In the United States of America, some work has been done. It showed that 88% of those referred to a traumatic brain injury clinic from um, abuse services, local abuse services, had had more than one brain injury from their partner. Only 21% of them had ever volunteered to go to a doctor with it. Um, Work done by the Ohio University found that 81% of domestic abuse survivors had received a blow to the head. 81%. But we have no idea in this country what the numbers are, what the true numbers are. Um, The Disabilities Trust did a really good piece of work um, in Drake Hall Prison with prisoners, women prisoners, coming onto the um, secure estate for the first time. And they found that 64% of women had had a brain injury, and 62% of those injuries had been from a domestic violence incident. Of course I was. Great, gentlemen. I both welcome and endorse his excellent amendment, not for the first time he's drawn brain injuries to the attention of this House. I wonder if through him I might invite the front bench, either by means of an intervention now or in the concluding remarks, to commit to the kind of research that the Honourable Gentleman has recommended to the House. Now, the work that was done, I'm grateful to him. He's been a, a doughty um, advocate of those who suffer from brain injuries, not least because of his own experience, and that, I, and I, and that has been invaluable to the House. 
Um, it's true that the Disabilities Trust work and work that has been done with male prisoners across the estate um, was a pilot scheme introduced by the Ministry of Justice. Um, it's been very effective. They've been able to... It's very simple screening, just three simple questions asked of, page, uh, uh, of people, prisoners arriving. Um, but it's me meant that people have been able to rectify some of the problems within the prison so that, um, for instance, people who, um, because of their brain injury, find loud noise um, uh, or, or clanging, smashing and things like that uh, very disruptive to them... Um, they've been able to put them simply, quite simply down the quiet end of the prison. Um, so sometimes just very simple um, measures have been able to tr transform the experience of those individuals, and tr transform their likelihood of reoffending, and given them a better opportunity in life. But this is writ even larger when it comes to women prisoners, because the evidence is clearly that many of the women coming into prison have actually been victims of domestic violence themselves. So the victim ends up being victimised a third time. And that's why all my amendments seek to do is, 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 is... My new clauses seek to do is, first of all, say that every single woman prison coming onto the prison estate um, should be screened. Very simple screening. Um, three questions. As has already been done previously in Drake Hall. Secondly, that every single woman who it has already been decided has gone through the process, we've decided that she is a, a victim of domestic violence, that every single woman in those instances should be screened for brain injury so that we can give them the proper neurorehabilitation that they require, so that they can understand the condition that they have and so that they can um, lead a fuller life. I am very disappointed by the Minister earlier. Um, I don't think she meant to mislead the House, but I I'm sure she didn't intend to mislead the House. But when she said that the National Screening Agency, I think she means the National Screening Committee, um, considered screening, um, actually what they considered was screening every single adult in the country for, for, um, for domestic violence. That isn't what we're talking about here. I hope she will rectify uh, the record when it comes to the end. So, John Hayes. Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful uh, uh, and pleased to follow the Honourable Gentleman who, who, as I've already said, has uh, made a persuasive case that I hope the Government will respond to in the way he suggests. For most of us, home is where the heart is. It's where we find love and warmth. And uh, I guess that most people here uh, would say that's true of their constituents, by and large. But for too many people that we represent, home is where the hurt is. It's a place of hate and pain. And it's a pain that dare not speak its name for many of them, because they feel shame. The irony, the bitter irony, is that some of the victims of domestic abuse feel that they are in some way to blame, that in some way they're guilty. And so it goes on year after year, unrecognised, unnoticed, and therefore untreated, undealt with. And this bill is a brave bill that, to some degree, begins the process. It, don't, it won't end here. This is a start, not a conclusion. It begins a process by which we can highlight, recognise and then act upon this awful spectre of domestic abuse. Uh, I remember tellingly uh, the case of a constituent who came to see me. Uh, one of the most memorable constituent cases we all have every month, every week, don't we? Uh, horrible things to deal with, dreadful things, memorable things in the worst way. But this stands out, even amongst them, in my memory. It was a gentleman I knew. I'd known him for years. I knew his son. I had no reason to believe he was unhappy. He was always very cheerful, rather a jolly sort of chap, in his mid-fifties. And he arrived at a surgery, and I didn't know why. I had no notice of what he wanted to see me about. And he sat in front of me, and with almost unbearable tension in the air, revealed to me that he'd been the subject for years of domestic abuse, that his uh, wife had been beating him. He was a disabled man, uh, and so the poignant uh, character of that exchange was exacerbated by knowing that she was much stronger than him, uh, much more powerful uh, than him. And he burst into te as he burst into tears, uh, I recognised that he was by far not the only uh, person like that in my constituency and in all our constituencies. And, of course, it is 
usually two-thirds of the cases, women, but it can be men too. Uh, and that uh, personal experience through him gave me an insight into what domestic abuse can be and mean for so many of those we represent. G.K. Chesterton remarked that the business done in the home is nothing less than the shaping of bodies and the souls of humanity. And home is where uh, most of our uh, experiences take place and the impact on the formation of an individual's earthly experience happens disproportionately in homes. And that's why uh, this bill is important and why I commend so warmly uh, ministers for bringing it to the House, particularly my great friend, the member for Lalfham Horncastle, and I mean no disrespect to my equally uh, good friend, the member for Cheltenham, by the way, um, uh, for championing this, this cause. My amendments seek to do two things, uh, as the House will have seen. The first is to monitor the kind of the relationship between the kind of relationship people are in and the propensity of domestic abuse. There is some evidence that the sort of relationship in which people uh, are fitted uh, does have an impact on the likelihood of uh, domestic abuse taking place. And whilst postmodernists may resent the idea that the government should play a part in uh, family formation and social solidarity. I don't share that view because I'm not postmodern. In fact, I'm not even modern, Madam Deputy Speaker, as many people here uh, know. So I ask the government to look at that in some detail uh, because there is some disturbing evidence to suggest that some kinds of relationships are particularly prone uh, to domestic abuse, which is a heinous crime. By any measure, I have to be aware. Well, thank you. Um, does my honourable friend uh, agree with me that we must absolutely not allow this vital piece of legislation to be potentially used by abusers to coerce pregnant women to have an abortion, by, to have an abortion and, and that our duty of protection towards vulnerable people should also have regard for the life of the unborn child, so that no Clause 28 has no place in this bill? Well, I wasn't going to deal with Clause 28 because it's been dealt with at some length. But I simply say to the Honourable Lady who tabled that, uh, who is a respected, by the way, member of this House and an experienced one, it was not wise to do so. For two reasons, because it's imperfectly drawn up, but also because, if anything, it takes emphasis away from the main thrust of this legislation, which is to deal with that heinous crime I've described. I think it, I, well, I will give way in a second, but more than that, but more than that, it may even frustrate the very purpose of this legislation by putting vulnerable women already suffering from the very fear that I described into an even more fearful circumstance. And I happily give way to the honourable lady, who will now doubt put a count of you. Well, I'm grateful for the uh, right honourable gentleman giving way. I want to make it very clear that obviously this, this clause was drafted, it's perfectly within order, it's referring to victims of domestic abuse and the particular circumstances they find themselves in in, acce in accessing reproductive health care. So I am getting a little uh, frustrated with... I, I hear what uh, honourable members think about the way the clause is drafted, but it's perfectly within order to bring this in this bill about women who are suffering from domestic abuse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just... I think there are times and places to have these debates. We take different views, but this is not the time and place to have it, and to say more would be to worsen that sin. Um, I, I mentioned the research about particular kinds of relationships. The ONS research from the year ending in March 19 shows that cohabiting women were almost three times more likely to have suffered domestic abuse compared to married women or women in civil partnerships. The figures also demonstrated that separated women were significantly more likely to suffer abuse than those in relationships. So there are, there are issues around the connection between abuse and particular family circumstances. My other amendment calls for the government to look at the character of these crimes and the sentences they attract, with a view to raising both the minimum and maximum sentences. Frankly, we ought to be doing that in all kinds of cases, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, but this case in particular warrants the government a look, a looking at these things again. And so I hope the government will look at my new clauses. I won't press them, 
because rather in the spirit I just suggested, this is a time for the House to come together in common cause, not to be divided, which is another reason I'm disappointed with Clause 28, and I hope uh, the Honourable New Clause 28, and I hope the Honourable Labour have the grace to withdraw it. Finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, C.S. Lewis said that love is not affectionate feeling, but ultimately a steady wish for a loved person's ultimate good. Supporting my new clauses will help good, as this bill will too. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I warmly welcome this bill and the amendments tabled to it. It has been urgent for a great many years, but perhaps never more so than now. I want to add my thanks in particular to the Right Honourable Members for Camberwell and Peckham and for Wire Forest for all they've done on the campaign on the rough sex defence. I want to associate myself in particular as well with Amendment 35, misogyny is a hate crime put down by uh, the Honourable Member for Walthamstow and spoken to very ably by the Member for Edinburgh West. And I would also urge the Government, as many others have done, to look again at the issue of migrant women and the issue of no recourse to public funds. I don't think that the Government has so far really recognised what's at stake here, and I think the suggestion made to simply uh, take away the, um, uh, the, the, the current uh, uh, law, um, would, as, as suggested by the uh, Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, would be a very positive way of dealing with this crisis right now. But what I wanted to rise to speak to in particular was a survivor's right to press anonymity, which I think is an omission from the Bill. This gap risks undermining many of the provisions designed to increase reporting and access to justice. Currently, the law allows the media to identify domestic abuse survivors when they appear in court. For, su for survivors, the majority of which are women, this means accepting yet another level of fear and risk. It potentially means that a perpetrator can more easily find them. It means every aspect of their past behaviour being potentially subjected to unaccountable scrutiny and judgment. Without press anonymity, domestic abuse survivors face the risk of being abused all over again. So my amendment, New Clause 19, has been developed with RISE, which is one of the leading service providers and advocates for uh, women in my constituency, and is based on their wealth of experience about what prevent, pre prevents women reporting domestic abuse and what keeps them as safe as possible once it does happen. The amendment seeks to ensure that survivors of, of domestic abuse receive the same guarantee of press anonymity that has been in place for survivors of sexual assault for almost 30 years via the Sexual Offences Amendment Act, 1992. Essentially, it, prevent, it would prevent identifiable details being published by the media online, in print or in social media, and it requires any content which breaches the anonymity to be deleted. That right to anonymity would come into force as soon as domestic abuse is reported to the police and last for a survivor's lifetime. It would also create a new offence whereby a publisher could be fined for anonymity breaches. This penalty and the level of fine is consistent with the 1992 Act and the rights of survivors of, sex, of sexual assault. Now, there are many reasons why failing to guarantee anonymity for survivors weakens the objectives of this bill. First, domestic abuse uh, victims and survivors are more likely to be killed within the first year of leaving an abusive partner, a time frame which frequently coincides with their cases coming to court. Naming survivors in the media puts their well-being and safety at further risk, putting them under unimaginable strain and anxiety, including their children, during what is already an extremely difficult process. Secondly, fear of being identified by friends, family members, work colleagues and employers after being named in the press actively discourages survivors from reporting domestic abuse. As one told Rise, and I quote, none of my family knew, neither did my employer. I felt sad, ashamed, embarrassed and violated. It must be a survivor's choice who they tell about an abusive relationship and when, not one taken from them by the media. The law as it stands wrests power and control from women in a situation where loss of power and control are already factors in their abuse. Thirdly, cases of domestic abuse can involve sexual abuse too, and inconsistent survivor anonymity provisions may lead to the 1992 Act being breached, perhaps inadvertently. The best way to keep survivors safe is to protect their anonymity, especially as sexual violence may not always be disclosed in domestic abuse reports. Now, the view of the Minister, as expressed in committee, is that these anonymity provisions are, in his words, an exceptional interference with open justice. Well, with respect, I think he is wrong. Of course, there is always a balance to be struck. But precedents are there, not just in the 1992 Act, but also in the Serious Crimes Act of 2015 on, uh, uh, on FGM and, and the Modern Slavery Act as well. 
Under my amendment, survivors can still be named in court. Journalists can still report on other aspects of the case. They simply won't be able to publish identifiable details, such as photographs, the survivor's name, their address or their workplace. This is not about restricting free speech. It's about keeping survivors safe and alive. And there is no justice unless that is one of the Bill's primary objectives. So I would urge the Government, please, to look again at this amendment. It brings this Bill in line with the amendment from the Sexual uh, uh, Offences Act 1992, and I believe would make it a better and more consistent Bill. Uh, There have been a lot of interventions, um, so the time of others has been extended, which means I'm going to have to um, reduce the time limit to four minutes after the next uh, speaker in order to get as many people in as possible. Um, Jackie Doyle Price. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, support this bill, which has been obviously the product of work from uh, input all over the House, and this is at its best uh, for that. But I particularly want to welcome the definition of what constitutes uh, domestic abuse, and in particular the emphasis placed on uh, sexual abuse in the definition. Uh, Because we all know that sexual abuse is very much in the toolkit of any abuser. And just as in the past domestic violence has been a taboo subject, the role of sexual violence has been too. And what's been striking about the passage of this bill is that I think that is a game changer. And the the clause which deals with the issue of rough sex most certainly is. And in that respect, I think this is making a very, very clear advance uh, in favour of the victims and against the abusers. And we must make sure we do everything that we can to protect those most vulnerable and bring what is the purveyor of evil crimes um, to justice. Um, Clearly, sexual violence is something which can take place in the domestic context, not just with partners, but also with children. And I think that's something uh, that we also uh, need to uh, consider. I also would like to highlight the comments made by my honourable friend, the member for Romsey in Southampton North, uh, where she talked about the sharing of sexual imagery uh, by the firms, which again can be considered a domestic abuse given that it's come from relationships. And I, I think that example just really highlights how normalised sexual abuse has become in some contexts. And, and personally, I feel very, very strongly that we collectively in this House, male members as well as female members, We must do all we can to make sure that women feel empowered to have control over their own destiny when it comes to their relationships. And and I fear that some of the pornography that is now so widely circulated and available is normalising sexual behaviour which is not in the interest of our women and girls. So I think this is something that we all collectively uh, must be uh, vigilant about. Now, I've tabled uh, two amendments really to, again, give added emphasis to the the importance of sexual violence uh, as a consideration of domestic violence context. And I've done so in consultation with Rape Crisis England and Wales, with whom I have the great pleasure of giving so much support, and they do so much, so much work. And quite often are considered the Cinderella in the way that, I, it, for the reasons that I've described. The, the, the real issue with victims of sexual violence is it never leaves them. And it's one thing bringing a perpetrator to justice. Um, but these women, these girls, these victims are not pieces of evidence. They are people and they are fragile and they need our support. And they need a lifetime of support. Now, I'm very pleased that the NHS have recognised this with their lifetime support care pathway for victims of sexual violence. But, as with many things in public policy, we can talk the talk, but we don't always walk the walk. Now, I'm really pleased to see that police and crime commissioners regularly step up to the plate to, to commission sufficient services for victims of sexual violence. But I see all too often that locally, NHS aren't doing their bit, and equally, we expect more from local authorities too. So the amendments in my name um, really are there to reboot the emphasis on sexual violence as an element of domestic violence in terms of the function of the Domestic Violence Commissioner and the local authorities. And I I hope the Minister in response could perhaps articulate the very real need for the holistic uh, support for victims of sexual violence and uh, an expectation that the Domestic Violence Commissioner will do the requisite thing and encourage good practice 
throughout our public uh, services. Um, in view of the time, which is very short, I, I, I will say little more than that. But I just wanted to quickly address the points being made by uh, about the, uh, the oh, right honourable member for Kingston Hall and Mills, uh, amendment on abortion. There's been much criticism made of that, which I think is unfair, frankly. The, the real point is that this is a law which is 50 years old. It is no longer fit for purpose. But because it is seen as a free vote issue, it is something that governments just do not look at. Now, I welcome to a point uh, what uh, my old friend the Minister has said today. But I actually think generally we, we need to look uh, more holistically at the safety of our abortion services. And it's all very well to say, OK, we've had these regulations for COVID, let's just extend them. I don't think that's good enough. I think that we need to make sure that we're told now there's as many as one in three people have access to abortion. Let's look at it more holistically. Yeah, yeah. Nadia Witomi. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's an honour to follow on from the member for Thorock. I wholeheartedly support the sensible and necessary amendments to this bill brought forward by several of my courageous and learned colleagues. I would particularly like to give mention to my honourable friend, the member for Canterbury, who has spoken courageously on domestic abuse, and to my excellent colleague, the member for Walthamstow, for her ongoing work to have misogyny treated as a hate crime. Yeah, yeah. I'm proud to represent Nottingham East, the birthplace of the movement to recognise misogyny as a hate crime. And I pay tribute to pioneers at Nottingham Women's Centre, as well as Juno Women's Aid, and in particular to Mel Jeffs. No recourse to public funds renders many of the most at-risk individuals completely powerless and increases their chances of being preyed upon by abusers or falling into destitution. Madam Deputy Speaker, the choice presented to members today is whether this bill progresses with or without leaving migrant women behind. Many migrant women are effectively excluded from the protective measures in this bill as they have no recourse to public funds. Can I ask the Minister what advice she has sought on whether this bill in its current form is in fact compliant with Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Istanbul Convention? Because we know that migrant women face additional barriers to safety because abusers common, commonly weaponise fears of immigration enforcement mm -hmm. and separation from their children to control them. The draft statutory guidance to accompany this bill clearly recognises that migrant women face these additional obstacles to safety and are afraid of reporting. Does the Minister accept that the Government's current policies in this area effectively encode and entrench the abuser-victim dynamic into the system? Will she acknowledge that the legislation as it currently stands does not match the facts recognised in the statutory guidance? It is promising, Madam Deputy Speaker, that some key amendments have made the cut, including recognition that children are victims of domestic yeah, abuse yeah. in their own right, as well as expanding the ban on abusers cross-examining their victims in court. But as Pragna Patel, director of Southwell Black Sisters, has said, the decision to leave migrant women out of this bill sends the message that their lives are not valued. They are disposable. They are second-class people. They are invisible. This invisibility is exacerbated through Clause 53, which neglects the commissioning of specialist support for BAME women in the community. There are only 30 specialists by and for black and minoritised women's refuges of the whole, for the whole of the UK, with 50% of BAME specialist refuges having been forced to close or been taken over by a larger provider due to government cuts in funding over the last decade. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to close with words from the End Violence Against Women Coalition, who have stressed that amending the bill is the only route to guarantee a fair system to all survivors and ensure compliance with the Istanbul Convention, which this bill seeks to ratify. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ruth Edwards. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. When I met my ex, I was a confident 17-year-old woman, but he wore me down until I didn't recognise myself anymore. The words, Madam Deputy Speaker, of a remarkable woman, 
my constituent, Natasha Saunders. And I want to share some of her story with this House today. But first, Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill has seen this House at its best, working together to increase awareness of domestic abuse and its devastating consequences, to strengthen support for victims and bring more perpetrators to justice. It will support victims to give evidence in court and it will end that most pernicious of defences, the so-called rough sex defence. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is a sad indictment of human nature that our work to tackle domestic abuse will never be over. Even as we pass this excellent bill, which does so much to protect victims, we must be looking to the next way in which abusers will seek to control and damage their victims, because we know all too well that's what they'll be doing which is why I want to speak to new Clause 34 today, which uh, seeks to strengthen revenge pornography laws, making it illegal to threaten to share intimate images of someone without their consent. And it's on this issue that I'd like to share Natasha's story. She says she'd been in a relationship with my, I'd been in a relationship with my ex-husband for six months when he first ordered me to remove my clothes and pose for intimate photos. In the beginning, I thought taking these photos was an act of intimacy, but they were soon used as a way to control me. I'd repeatedly tell him that I didn't feel comfortable taking intimate photos. When I refused, he would taunt me. He would berate me and mock my appearance until I gave in. Posing for these photos made me feel so dirty and worthless, but I was a teenager and I wanted to make him happy. Natasha's partner threatened to share these photos with her family and friends. She said she felt so exposed and ashamed. The threat was always there, and as the years went on, it was like I ceased to exist. He made me feel invisible to everyone, and if I displeased him in any way, I knew he could use those pictures to ruin my reputation. Natasha is a huge inspiration, who has not only survived a horrendous ordeal of abuse and built a new life for herself, but also now works with Refuge to help other women. Today, Refuge have published new research that lays bare the scale of this issue. It finds that one in 14 adults in England and Wales have experienced threats to share. That's four and a half million stories like Natasha's. I know the Law Commission is in the middle of a review which covers a wider set of offences around the making and sharing of sexual images online. And that this is why the provisions in New Clause 34 are not in this bill. Having spoken to both Ministers taking this bill through Parliament, I am in no doubt over their commitment to improving the law in this area, and I am grateful to them for taking on board our views that the time frame for this review, due to report in the summer of 2021, is a long time for victims to wait. I know that as a result, the National Police Chiefs Council is now working with the College of Policing to issue clearer guidance to officers about the legal tools they currently have to prosecute some threats to share. I hope more victims will have justice as a result. It is important that we have the right laws, fit for the digital age. That's why I think we should move quickly as soon as the Law Commission reports. And I would leave Ministers with this one thought. Our response to coronavirus has shown the speed at which we can move if we have to. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this approach was adopted for the Law Commission's review and we saw it reporting by the end of this year instead of next? Laura Ferris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I will confine my remarks to the Government's new Clause 20 concerning the rough sex defence, which the front bench should feel proud of. The first question any Government has to answer when it brings new, new legislation before the House is why that legislation is needed. And it's been said that if the common law already says that you can't consent to serious injury or death, then does Parliament need to legislate? And the answer is emphatically yes, and here's why. The Crown and Brown, the authority for this issue, which is nearly 30 years old, does not con cover consent in all forms of sexual harm. There are other cases, contradictory cases, which can be applied, and we saw that pretty starkly in the case of Natalie Connolly, where Brown was applied, but only in part. When it came to her internal injuries, the ones that were the most savagely inflicted, the most serious, the most proximate cause of death, the court applied a completely different case and concluded that the violence in that context 
was lawful. And that couldn't happen under New Clause 20 because it rules out the possibility of consenting to any serious harm for sexual gratification, and the inconsistency goes. But the second problem with Brown is that it answered one specific question, whether the defence of consent should apply to the infliction of bodily harm in the course of sadomasochistic encounters. I've heard it described as a case about consensual torture, and that's always created the risk of conflating violent sex in a domestic abuse context with BDSM, and in fact we saw it in Natalie Connolly's case, but also others, where sadomasochism becomes a, a sort of prism through which the violence on the night is interpreted, because Brown invites that. And not only does it traduce the reputation of the victim, but it also offends one of the most fundamental principles of justice, that he who asserts must prove. And in these serious cases, it's not proven in a way that a member of the public would understand. All we know is that it was violent and it was sexual and that she's dead. So Clause 20 reduces the risk of the courts being drawn into considerations of this kind by drawing a line through consent in the first place. But above all, codifying the defence sends a powerful message about what we as a society say about sexual violence and degrading behaviour in a way that the common law never could. In fact, Clause 20 is not didactic. It doesn't try and tell people how to live their private lives. But it does send a powerful message to the perpetrator that you will be responsible for all the consequences of your actions. And that is a game changer when rape convictions are at an all-time low. But the most affecting feature of the last two weeks has been seeing how other countries have reacted to the government's decision. In New Zealand, where they were as appalled by the Grace Mullane case as we were, but also in Ireland and Hungary and Germany and France and Canada, they're writing about what the British government is doing in the context of similar cases that have been before their courts and with reference to members of their own parliaments who are working to achieve the same thing. And I think the ministers involved should feel proud of the leadership they've shown on this. Madam Deputy Speaker, finally... The most powerful message of Clause 20 is a tacit one, and it's about the dignity of the women who have been killed in this way. That it's not the perpetrator in the dock who gets to define her. It's not the judge in his sentencing remarks, but it's we in Parliament who draw a line in the sand and say, in effect, what the victims and their families never could, that she could not consent to that. Yeah. Catherine West. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's a delight to have heard the member for Newbury and her excellent points that she made in her speech. Um, I wanted briefly to put on record um, three fantastic women who have worked in this area in my constituency. Denise Marshall, who was the Chief Executive of EVES, um, the uh, wonderful Mary Mason, who was the Chief Executive of Solace Women's Aid, and Harriet Wistrich, who is the Director of the Centre for Women's Justice and worked very hard on the Sally Challen case, not dissimilar to the cases which the member for Newbury mentioned, although in the case of Sally Challen, of course, she was found to be um, acquitted after many years in prison, um, and she was subject to some awful coercive behaviour from her partner, who she actually killed. Um, and that was um, a case which my um, constituent, Harriet Wistrich, worked very, very hard on and is now a precedent. And we do need these important test cases in order to prove um, how we can improve the law, how we can improve women's experience. Um, I want to welcome uh, three other elements of this bill. Um, the first is the new robust framework uh, for the new Domestic Abuse Commissioner. Um, the two new civil protection orders which will strengthen um, the practice, the everyday practice on domestic abuse. Um, I want to welcome the secure lifetime tenancy in England housing authorities and mention briefly the work of Hearthstone, which is the Haringey Council's excellent housing um, provision for women facing domestic violence. Um, and the fact that it's embedded within the local authority allows much better quality allocations for women who are facing um, uncertain housing situations. Um, any bill like this, the test of it is not just how well the bill's written or what fantastic speeches we may all give tonight, but what quality the legal aid is like which women and which victims of domestic violence can get day in, day out in our courts. And I'm sorry to say that we still haven't got legal aid 
matching the desperate need that so many women victims have. And I do hope that the government will look um, at a future point at provision of legal aid. It's not specifically necessarily in this legislation, but in terms of the practice and the everyday experience, we need excellent legal representation for those women. I briefly wanted also to put on record my support for the clause looking at um, misogyny as a hate crime, which the Honourable Member for Walthamstow um, has spoken so eloquently about um, as part of the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. Um, I also wanted to put on record my support for new clause 22 for women who have insecure immigration status um, and a fear of deportation. Um, looking through my casework of this month, I had a case of um, a woman who um, had no recourse to public funds and was not able to uh, gain access to the important um, provisions uh, because she didn't have that access to important um, uh, financial housing benefit and all the other provisions. Fortunately, having written to the Home Office, my caseworker did have an amazing success. Huge thank you to my team. But it cannot be down to an individual case-by-case uh, -case basis like this. We do need to have a much more holistic um, look at no recourse to public funds. And I was very pleased to hear the Minister announce this evening that there will be a pilot scheme worth £1.5 million. But I do fear that with pilot schemes, they then peter out or they're introduced very late on in the financial year. They tend to be very piecemeal. And in my view, we desperately need to pass this new Clause 22 so that we can take in the most vulnerable women, um, including those with no recourse to public funds, who we see in our surgeries. And we cannot rely on the fact that they may pop into our surgeries. We can write to the Home Office. We need a much more inclusive clause than that. So please vote for new Clause 22 tonight. Thank you. Chris Clarkson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to start by saying this is a good bill. Um, I'd particularly like to add my uh, support to New Clause 20 and pay tribute to my honourable friend, the new member for Newbury, uh, also my honourable friend, the member for Wye Forest, and to the mother of this House, the right honourable member for Campbell and Peckham, for their work on this. I'd also like to pay tribute to my honourable friend, the uh, member for the cities of London and Westminster, for her work on New Clause 15, which I think achieves a great deal of good. Um, I'd like to briefly touch on new clauses uh, 22, 25 and 26. Um, I welcome the Government's long-standing commitment to support all domestic abuse, abuse survivors, including migrants, and they should always be treated as victims, regardless of their immigration status. The introduction of the Destitution Domestic Violence Concession and the Domestic Violence Identifiable Leave to Remain scheme in 2012 were important steps in supporting migrant women um, who are victims of domestic abuse. I think it's important to note that in obtaining these visas, it means that those affected have set up their lives in the UK with the expectation of obtaining indefinite leave to remain here. Already, this concession, permit, uh, concession permits them to receive welfare payments, support, safe accommodation, and the scheme enables them to apply for the indefinite leave to remain that they would have had uh, had they not been a victim of domestic abuse. The concession and the scheme are not available to people who enter the country on other visas, such as visitor student work visas or are here illegally. As we've heard, this is because in order to obtain such visas, they've already confirmed they are financially independent and therefore require no recourse to public funds. And, as such, their stay will be for a defined time. They do not, therefore, have a legitimate expectation of securing indefinite leave to remain. I welcome that the Government has pledged £1.5 million towards a pilot later this year, which will be used to assess the level of need for migrant victims of domestic abuse and inform decisions going forward. I join my right hon. Friend, the Member for Maidenhead, in hoping that this will identify the gaps in the current support available. Um, at this point, I was going to talk about new amendments 40 through to uh, 43, but as I understand from the Honourable Lady, the Member for Birmingham Yardley, they won't be brought forward. So I won't labour that point as time is short, but I would nonetheless like to put on the record how welcome the appointment of Nicole Jacobs is as Domestic yes. Abuse yes. Commissioner and the establishment of her independent office, which rightly holds the Government to account to ensure that all areas are working better to protect victims. I have the utmost confidence that my Right Honourable Friend, the Secretary of State, will listen to her sage advice. Abuse, Madam Deputy Speaker, can come in a myriad forms, not just physical control or coercion, but financial and mental too. And having listened to my right honourable friend, the member for Romsey and Southampton North, it's clear that we also have to consider that the new forms abuse can take as technology and society develop. I welcome that the Commissioner will be required to have specific focus on victims from minority groups, and I hope that she will include the LGBT plus community 
who experience disproportionately high levels of domestic abuse and also experience distinct barriers in accessing support. Finally, I would like to thank the Ministers and members from both sides of the House for all their work on this truly historic bill, which puts the determination to protect victims and their families at the very heart of our law. Liz Twist. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it is a pleasure to be able to take part in this debate this evening. Children are victims of domestic abuse, not just witnesses. In March this year, I held a Westminster Hall debate on this very issue, and that was the start of a series of conversations thereafter. At the conclusion of that debate, I said to the Minister, who is no longer in her place, that I would like her to go away and grapple some more with the resolution to including children in the Bill. And I'm really pleased to see that today we have uh, new clause 15 proposed, which will indeed uh, include children in the definition of domestic abuse. This is something which has had such widespread support from charities and organisations across the children's sector and from violence against women and girls sector. And they have come together to assure us that they are united in believing that children should be included. This amendment, recognising and seeing children as victims of domestic abuse, will lead to a greater understanding that children experience domestic abuse too, and hopefully will lead service to providers to ensure that they get the services that they need. And I thank the Minister for her, uh, her work on this. But this amendment isn't on its own enough. We know that children affected by domestic abuse can recover and lead help, happy and healthy childhoods, but they need the right support and they need it at the right time. New Clause 15 recognises children as victims, helping local authorities recognise the importance in ensuring that child victims have access to support. However, it won't help those local authorities deliver the support services in question. There's a huge issue, um, as we know that provision is patchy as it is, uh, with the COVID-19 crisis only exacerbating existing difficulties and inequalities. Currently, the bill includes a welcome duty on local authorities to provide support to adult and child survivors in accommodation-based services. This is a step in the right direction, but limited duty, this limited duty risks unintended consequences such as removing funding from key community-based services that are absolutely crucial to supporting child victims of domestic abuse. So the Government must ensure that community-based services are provided and crucially funded under any new statutory duty. Therefore, I'm all supporting new, also supporting new Clause 23, which will address both, both the access to services and the funding required to keep them running. And following on from that, uh, we think often of domestic abuse services, refuges and perhaps the police as the front line against domestic abuse. But in fact, women experiencing abuse are much more likely to suffer a range of negative outcomes, including homelessness, substance abuse, mental health problems and be in touch with a wide range of public services. Therefore, it's important that we also ensure that front line, people working on the front line of public services are able to recognise the signs and provide support and assistance and highlight issues to make sure that those people get the support that they need with a training programme to raise that awareness. Finally, I want to talk briefly about New Clause 22. Much has been said, and I can say no more than to say that people who are suffering from domestic abuse, um, it shouldn't be a choice between whether you have uh, your immigration status, and therefore I'm supporting New Clause um, 22 to ensure that uh, people who have new, no recourse to public funds in future have that help. Christine Wakeford. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I was proud to support this bill at the second reading, and I'm happy to see the bill back here today for its final stages uh, today. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is indeed a landmark piece of legislation, and it really does show the best of this House when we can work cross party to achieve something fundamental. Although if, uh, if I was to have one criticism about this bill, it would be that it could achieve so much more. That said, this is an admirable start and one that I fully endorse. However, the bill needs to be the starting point to protecting victims 
and not for destination. Madam Deputy Speaker, I wish to pay tribute to my honourable friends for Newbury, Wye Forest and the Right Honourable Member uh, for Camberwell and Peckham for securing the amendment on rough sex uh, NC20, which will prevent men from literally getting away with murder. Madam Deputy Speaker, this needs to be a victim-led process with concerns about a stalker's register where it's the victims themselves who need to actually correct their behaviour, and that can't be right. If a victim has to modify their behaviour, then we have let down the victim. I am hopeful that the Minister will agree with me that there is a scope to review victim support services and that victims should be included in that process. Despite the good intentions of stalking protection orders, I fear that these will not protect victims in the way that they should. Madam Deputy Speaker, this truly is a heinous crime and if not prevented, can and often does lead to further crime such as sexual abuse and even murder. The Honourable Member for Birmingham Yardley actually mentioned the murder of Jane Clough. Uh, Now, I am a long-standing friend of her sister, uh, Louise Berry, um, who obviously tragically lost Jane ten years ago. And it would be remiss of me not to pay tribute to John and Penny Clough for the fantastic work they've done with the Justice for Jane campaign, who have worked tirelessly to prevent other women from paying the ultimate and avoidable cost of this crime. I also wish to pay tribute to the Honourable uh, Member for Pendle uh, for securing an amendment to the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act, which allowed the prosecution to appeal against the bail to further aid victims in this awful crime. Madam Deputy Speaker, I I conclude by reiterating my opening remarks, but if we are serious about tackling this most heinous of crimes that has affected millions of women throughout recent years, that we really need to make sure that the victims are fully included in this entire journey and that this is a journey. This isn't the destination. This is just the start of that process to make sure that we do tackle this uh, crime fully. But in doing so, we need to make sure that adequate funding is in place to not only bring the perpetrators to justice, but to protect these victims in their entirety. I trust the Minister will continually review this matter and take further action where needed to truly support victims of this most awful crime. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I say at the outset uh, that I want to thank the Minister and members from all sides of this House for bringing to fruition a bill that will protect uh, and support victims of domestic abuse. Many in this House have uh, outlined the fact that domestic abuse is on the rise in the UK and Northern Ireland figures released just today show an increase of 1,000 cases in the past three months. Figures show that there is a 15% increase on the same period last year. And domestic abuse is no respecter of gender or age. I just uh, listened to an interview last week in the car as I travelled around the constituency of a young lady called Jolene Corr, 27-year-old uh, girl from Downpatrick. Uh, she was a mum of one and she was propelled down a set of stairs and died as a result of a brain injury. Her mum was devastated and, and continues to be devastated. So I, I trust that this legislation will assist in bringing some comfort to people like the core family. As a wife and mum, I am thankful for the safe haven of my own home, uh, but I know that many throughout uh, the UK do not have that safety that, that I enjoy. And I want this bill uh, just to be the start of great things to assist uh, victims. I also want to pay tribute to Mr Stephen Smith from Northern Ireland, who today is running 100 miles in awareness for Men's Alliance Northern Ireland, a support group for male victims of domestic abuse, and I want to commend him for his efforts. I want to speak to New Clause 28. And Madam Deputy Speaker, a person who works uh, with women experiencing domestic abuse in England said this about New Clause 28 over the weekend. We work every day with women who experience domestic abuse. We see the way they are controlled and manipulated. To me, this suggested legislation will only be making that worse. It will give abusers more power and more reason to keep the women being abused at home away from people who can really help them. This House should not hinder these professionals 
in their work. This amendment seems to be a clear attempt to use the Domestic Abuse Bill as a vehicle to advance an agenda, an agenda that is emphatic on expanding access to abortion, seemingly failing to acknowledge that allowing women to have an abortion at locations other than hospitals or places approved by the Secretary of State has already led to serious complications. We all know that abortion is not the answer to domestic abuse. Surely we should be addressing how women find themselves in such difficult situations and take measures to actually yeah, prevent this. Yet, I will give Thank my the honourable friend for giving way. Does the member agree that pushing this agenda has led to the ludicrous situation in Northern Ireland where one minister brought forward a proposal to allow for abortion pills to be administered by a foreign jurisdiction over the phone to patients in Northern Ireland. Is she appalled by that uh, proposal as much as I am offended? I agree with my honourable friend. It's an absolutely terrible situation that we have in Northern Ireland as a result of the, the legislation that was railroaded uh, through this House and forced on the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, this amendment makes no provision for helping women get out of their abusive uh, situation, providing women with abortion pills while failing to address the reasons why women may be unable to safely attend a clinic does not present itself as a responsible or logical solution to tackling domestic abuse. Our laws should be designed to help vulnerable women escape domestic abuse situations, not enable them to remain in these horrific situations. Indeed, if a woman is not assessed in person, specifically given an ultrasound, and if, she's, uh, if she has went beyond the legal limit for an abortion by pills, the risk of complication uh, goes up dramatically. Coercive, uh, coercion of some kind is frequent in an unplanned pregnancy and in removing the requirement of a face-to-face -face consultation, there is no guarantee that a patient can speak freely without the coercive party listening in. Furthermore, we know that women are coerced into having abortions based on sex selection. Um, if a partner, an abusive partner, does not want a particular sex of a child, they can actually force their partner into having an abortion uh, via the telemedicines. Uh, turning then to new clause 1, I welcome changes being made in relation to removing the defence of consent in cases of rough sex, but believe we need to do more to tackle the drivers for rough sex practices. And so I strongly support new clause 1 in the name of the Honourable Member for Coglinton and can I commend her for her efforts and work in this regard. This House needs to be clear about depictions of rough sex and pornography. Such practices cannot be normalised and such content should be made illegal. In terms of pornography that is already illegal, it is noticeable that, this camp that the campaign group We Can't Consent to This, who have been advocating for a change in the law on the rough sex defence, states that, and I quote, in four of the recent killings of women and girls, the men viewed extreme porn featuring violence, including strangulation, before or after the killing of the women. Order. Nikki Aiken. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Madam Speaker, this bill, as it stood at second reading, was a remarkable piece of legislation. But now, having gone through the bill committee stage, I believe it has improved further. And now, at its third reading, its legislation, when it comes, will be the whole House should be very, very proud of it. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill sits on a long and impressive list of legislation that successive government, Conservative governments have introduced over the last 30 years. The Children's Act 1989, the 1997 Protection from Harassment Act, creating the offence of harassment, the 2012 Protection of Freedom Act, which created the offence of stalking, the 2015 Modern Slavery Act, which our right honourable friend from Maidenhead put through the House, which created the offences regarding slavery, servitude, human trafficking and provision for protection of victims. Would she give way? Certainly will. I thank the Honourable Lady for giving way. She and I served on the Bill Committee together and I completely agree with everything she's saying, but would she agree with me that bringing forward this Bill right now during the coronavirus pandemic and pushing it forward throughout the lockdown is another piece of evidence for this Government's support for victims? I absolutely agree with my Honourable Friend. 
Carrying on the list, the Serious Crime Act 2015, which created the offence of coercive control. And in 2017, the Conservative government doubled the maximum sentence for stalking. And in 2019, passed the Stalking Protection Act, creating stalking protection orders. Which leads us today to this domestic abuse bill, which I dearly hope we will see into law shortly. An impressive history from this side of the chamber, taking strong, decisive and meaningful action to protect those who are unable to protect themselves and giving a voice to the most vulnerable. I think it is also important to note the notable gap of such laws between 1997 and 2010. Mm. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have been honoured to sit on the domestic abuse bill, my first bill as a Member of Parliament. And I think it's important to say that during the second reading debate and on my tenure on the bill committee, I highlighted the need to amend the definition of yep. domestic abuse to include children within households with such, where such abuse is present, yeah. to recognise children as the victims of abuse, not just as witnesses. Mm. It is estimated that up to 30% of children live in a household where abuse is taking place. Until now, the children were hidden victims of domestic abuse who were never directly affected. But we know this isn't true. The children's services teams up and down the country, children's charities such as Bernardo's and the Children's Society, see every day the devastating effects witnessing such abuse can have on a child's development, their education attainment and their long-term mental health. I saw it myself as children's services lead at Westminster. Home is meant to be our place of safety, where we are loved, cherished the most. But for some children, home becomes a torture chamber, waking up every moment, every morning, not knowing whether a tiny mistake will lead to violence and the type of abuse most of us could never imagine. As well as my experience in, within children's services, my campaign to seek this amendment to the definition was also sparked from hearing the experiences of a constituent of mine who has become a friend, the broadcaster Charlie Webster. Charlie has told me her story of growing up in a home where domestic abuse at the hands of her stepfather had a devastating effect on her, her mum and her brothers. Charlie is a survivor and now a strong campaigner for a better understanding of the effects witnessing domestic abuse can have on a child. And I thank her today for helping me clearly understand why the definition had to be amended. I therefore wholeheartedly support and welcome the, the, the Government's new Clause 15 recognising children as victims of abuse with their, within their households. I am pleased that for the purpose of this new clause, the child is recognised as someone under 18, so it will include teenagers and young adults, who, although maybe more developed than their young peers, are still forming an understanding of the world around them. It is very important to me to highlight the need to amend the definition to include children and why I lobbied ministers to accept the need for the amendment and I'm delighted that they listened. Yeah. In fact, the government has listened throughout this process. In closing, I would like to pay tribute to the ministers who have led on this legislation. Yeah. Yeah. My honourable yeah. friends, the member for Lawn and Hornchurch and for Cheltenham. As a new MP, I've been in awe of both their attention to detail, but also their willingness to listen to all <laughs> sides of the House, to victims and to organisations working within domestic abuse. And also I pay tribute to the Home Secretary and the Lord Chancellor for yeah, their yeah. work on this. Yeah. The amendments that have been accepted are testament to the ambitions of this Government and, the, and, and their own ambitions, that this Bill will make a long-lasting and fundamental difference. And I commend this vital and groundbreaking domestic abuse bill to the House. Stephen Timms. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to follow the Honourable Member representing the cities of London and Westminster. I was disappointed she struck a more partisan tone than uh, other speakers in the debate and, and perhaps didn't recognise as fully as she might the contribution to the current bill that's been made by members on this side of the, the House. And I'm glad that um, in the debate across the, the chamber that has been acknowledged. But I want to uh, speak, Madam Deputy Speaker, specifically on new clause 22 that's been tabled as an am amendment to this bill on access to public funds for survivors of domestic abuse. Uh, I think people are often quite surprised to discover there is a large number of families in the UK, law-abiding, hard-working often with children born in the UK, sometimes children who are UK nationals, um, whose immigration status is subject 
to this no recourse to public funds uh, condition. At the Liaison Committee uh, on the 27th of May, I asked the Prime Minister about the position of a Pakistani origin family in my constituency with two children, both born in the UK, uh, that the uh, father had stopped work because of the uh, coronavirus uh, lockdown and that family was being forced into destitution because they had no recourse to public funds. The Prime Minister's answer was that a family in that situation should be entitled to help of one kind or another. And I very much agree with that view that the Prime Minister uh, put, put forward. Unfortunately, the government's current policy does not deliver uh, help to families in that uh, situation. Over three million people have claimed universal credit since the beginning of March because their work has ended and they haven't been eligible for one or other of the government schemes. Uh, that vital safety net provided by universal credit is simply not available for people with no recourse to public funds. And both the uh, Home Affairs and the Work and Pension Select Committees have recommended unanimously that the no recourse to public funds restriction should be lifted for the duration of the current crisis. One of the points the Prime Minister made at the Liaison Committee was that he'd find out how many people uh, are in that position um, unfortunately, he hasn't been able to because the Home Office doesn't know. Uh, it appears the Home Office doesn't even have an estimate of how, how many there are. Fortunately, the Children's Society has reported that there are at least 100,000, over 100,000 children in the UK whose parents have leave to remain but no recourse uh, to public funds. Where someone is a victim of domestic abuse, having no recourse to public funds is catastrophic. Protections that the House supports for victims are simply not available. The barriers they face are generally insurmountable. Only 5% of refuge vacancies are accessible. Uh, the reason is that housing costs for, in a refuge are largely met through housing benefit. People with no recourse to public funds cannot claim housing benefit. As Women Aid, Women's Aid points out, the options for a woman with no recourse to public funds, unable to access a refuge space, are shocking. Either homelessness or returning to the perpetrator. I welcome the fact that there is a, a small pilot underway, but we know what the gap is. Anyone who came to the UK other than on a spouse uh, visa cannot uh, benefit from the domestic violence uh, concession. The other people uh, in this category need that help as well, and I do urge the House to support new clause 22. Peter Gibson. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Madam yeah. Deputy yeah. Speaker. It is a pleasure to speak in this debate, having sat on the Bill Committee. Yeah. Yeah. It was indeed a privilege that my very first Bill Committee was on such a groundbreaking piece of legislation and so ably led by dedicated ministers. Yeah. Yeah. I have met numerous victims of domestic abuse, each with a moving personal story of their sadly continuing ordeal. All too often, the abuse continues and sadly escalates after a relationship ends. I believe that this bill addresses that. Whilst the majority of victims of domestic abuse are women, we know that men are victims too. I draw upon the family experience of a relative of mine who was attacked by his wife, who attempted to stab him, who attempted to poison him, who inflicted broken bones, and repeatedly harassed him with abusive telephone calls at work. The harassment continued even after a traumatic divorce. Abuse and manipulation of their children continued too. The scars on my relative and his children are long-lasting. It is my belief that this bill would have curtailed this abuse at a much earlier stage and saved much trauma to the victim, his children, and saved much wasted resources. I welcome new Clause 15. Family Help in Darlington were one of the UK's first women's refuges and who have been doing amazing work 
in my constituency since 1976. I thank them for all that they do and for the help and understanding that they have given me in respect of this important area. Whilst they welcome all that this bill does, they have asked that I urge ministers to ensure that funding streams will enable them to plan into the future. Rydal Academy, a primary school in my constituency, is undertaking fantastic work with its higher than average concentration of children from homes where abuse happens. The key safeguarding leads at the school are keen to see perpetrator programmes put in place locally and to that end the generational cycle of abuse that is all too familiar. Again, I welcome the provisions in the Bill that will address that. Domestic abuse is not confined to heterosexual relationships alone, and I welcome that this Bill provides the same protections to those victims who are sadly suffering in same-sex relationships. And I echo the plea of my honourable friend, the Member for Hayward and Middleton, on this point. This Bill has seen a long passage having undergone many stages in this House and in the previous Parliament, but I believe that we can be proud of the protections we are bringing to the statute book, building on those protections listed by my honourable friend, the Member for the Cities of London and Westminster. But this Bill is not the place to make changes to our abortion laws. I will therefore be opposing Clause 28. Tracy Braben. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's been a privilege to sit in this debate and hear so many very personal stories, not just about constituents, but family members as well. And it's been, it's, it was very interesting to and moving to listen to the member for Darlington talk about his family to remind us that it's not just women that are victims of abuse. And I would like to thank all members of this House who've pushed this bill um, to this point through prorogation and COVID and lots of other challenges and the hard work that's gone, uh, gone on. And um, I've spoken twice uh, in this debate and um, I was uh, very honoured to put my name to the amendment of uh, our, our honourable friend, the member for Camberwell and Peckham, which has now been withdrawn. Um, but whilst Labour will be not moving, the, our new clause will be strongly supporting the government's new clause 20. And I'm grateful the government have listened to the demands here and in the wider community for major new inclusions, because we know 60 women in the UK have died, with more being injured in what men claim is violence that she asked for. No one can fail to be moved by the courage of the parents for those who have been brutally murdered by so-called lovers, only for the abuser to use the rough sex excuse to lessen their sentence. I'd also like so many others in the House like to thank the campaign group We Can't Consent to This for the work they've done to ensure justice is served and to support their request that the CPS and the Director of Public Prosecutions collect and evaluate data on this issue and report back on any use of rough sex claims. The government say they'll continue to keep the criminal law under review and we must uh, see a clear statement of how this will be done. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my council, Kirk Lees, who have committed an extra £400,000 in this year's budget to improve domestic violence support services locally. Many of the MPs will know that we rely on local support to, give, uh, to help women and girls at risk of violence, and that support has faced desperate cuts to policing, preventative services for almost a decade, and hopefully this will go some way to support them, because we need support in the community Community, not just in refuges. I'd also like to pay a tribute to, to the personal commitment the Honourable Member for Louth and Horncastle, uh, explicitly recognising children as victims of domestic abuse. And I would like to just um, uh, uh, comment on new clause 15 that puts children at the proposed legal definition, helping to put children at the heart of how society deals with domestic abuse, supported by the honourable friend, my honourable friend from Birmingham Yardley, because this is vital as there's compelling evidence that shows children exploited in gangs are more likely to have domestic violence call-outs, which is another reason we have to eradicate domestic violence where there are children in the family. The impact is felt throughout their lives, and we must protect them with every tool at our disposal. Domestic abuse affects children and young people in different ways, which means a range of interventions must be available so children can get the right form of specialist help. But it's obvious we need the money. 
Between 2010 and 11 and 2018-19, central government funding for children and young people's services fell by 2.2 billion pounds. And Women's Aid Federation of England's survey on the impact of COVID found 60% of the service providers that responded had needed to reduce or cancel their service for provision for children. Crucially, we need local authorities. And they have reported that policy and best practice guidance on domestic abuse was insufficient. And most felt that a statutory duty adequately funded to provide services would support them. And I'd just like, finally like to say to all those young women who have contacted me as well, we are listening to you. Just because you're not in a domestic situation, that doesn't mean to say you are not being abused. And hopefully this bill will be there to help you. Yeah. Alexander yeah. Stafford. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Domestic abuse is a scourge in our society. We must take robust and meaningful action to tackle the perpetrators and protect the victims of the despicable crime. I warmly welcome this bill and the government amendments to the bill, which recognise the vulnerability of children, victims giving evidence in court, and those in sexual relationships. I wish to speak on three new clauses. New Clause 28 first, which extends the temporary provision for abortion pills to be posted and taken at home, threatens to hijack the bill and draw our focus away from the very serious subject matter at hand. Abortion is an incredibly sensitive matter, which deserves close consideration. Such a seismic change to the law should not be tacked on to a domestic abuse bill as an amendment, as it lessens some of its impact. Disturbingly, the new clause does not have a gestation period limit and is not limited to medical abortions. In terms of addressing domestic abuse, as we've already heard, this amendment could in fact worsen the very problem that they are trying to address. By removing confidential face-to-face -face meetings between women and a medical professional, it becomes impossible for clinicians to establish where the woman is coerced into requesting the home pill, or even if it is in fact her on the telephone. Indeed, this is a serious point, and we should not do anything which could make domestic abuse any worse. I now wish to focus on two, the two government amendments particularly carefully, starting with New Clause 15, which concerns children as victims of domestic abuse. The clause provides that references in the bill to a victim of domestic abuse include children who see or hear or experience the effects of abuse. And I think that looking at the seeing or hearing is also incredibly important because you can be abused by not actually being physically harmed yourself. What you witness in your environments is incredibly important too. Mm. 831,000 children in England alone are living in households that report to domestic abuse. It is the most common additional factor of needed identification at the end of children's social care assessments, being identified in more than half of relevant assessments. This is a shockingly high figure, Madam Deputy Speaker. Domestic abuse can have a devastating impact on young people, resulting in emotional, social, physiological and behavioural difficulties with short and long-term implications. Madam Deputy Speaker, children are always blameless in these situations, and every child deserves to live in a stable and secure home. Witnessing abuse is frightening and damaging, and it's only right that children are regarded as victims. For in this situation, they clearly are, and it's a great change that this is having to this bill. This amendment is clearly worded and is a necessary protection to some of the most vulnerable people in society, our children. I feel that I also must note my support for new Clause 20. The existing defence in law allows abusers to kill their partners and, by, by calling on this, lessen their sentences. But not only does it lessen people's sentence, it also increases the abuse, pain and suffering under this rough sex defence. This is deeply distressing, Madam Deputy Speaker, for the families of the murdered victims. New Clause 20 removes the defence and ensures that there can be no impunity or refuge from justice for abusers in any shape or form. Therefore, under no short of time, New Clause 15 and New Clause 20 will protect children and partners in Rother Valley and across the country. The wide-ranging and detailed nature of the bill is a clear reminder that the government will pursue domestic abuse wherever it exists. And I am pleased that so many from across this House have been working together to make sure that any things are being ironed out in the bill, to make sure that children are put at the heart of it. And for that, I am proud to support these government amendments to this transformable bill. Thank you, Thank you Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak for Amendment 35 in the absence of my honourable friend, the member for Walthamstow, who could not be here to contribute to this debate in person as her childcare needs means uh, that she has a proxy vote. I would like to express my appreciation for, to her for her work in tabling Amendment 35. 
Amendment 35 goes to the heart of so many cases of domestic abuse in that it makes the link between domestic abuse and misogyny. Violence against women and girls does not occur in a vacuum. Hostility towards women and girls generates a culture in which violence and abuse is tolerated and excused. Changing that means challenging not only individual acts of abuse, but the very source which enables it. The gathering of evidence about the extent, nature and prevalence of hostility towards women and girls and how this <coughs> interplay with the experience of domestic abuse is crucial to recognising these connections. This amendment proposes to mandate police forces around the country to record misogyny as a hate crime where they are not already doing so. The mandatory collecting of data by police forces will help assess how misogyny influences the experience of domestic abuse. Because once we start to record the experiences of women victims by acknowledging, naming and recording the problem, the problem which is that of male violence, male entitlement and the gender bias when women report these experiences, we not only start to track perpetrators, we can also seek to add to our understanding of the nature of violence against women in order to work on how to end it. In the words of my honourable friend, the member for Canterbury, for many abusers, the idea of a strong, independent, successful woman is just that, an idea. They do not like the reality. Misogyny in the context of domestic abuse can present itself in an abuser characterising women other than his partner with sexist stereotypes and admonishing his partner to be different. An abuser may want his partner to dress and groom attractively or even modestly, but also then label her for doing so. Despite the evidence from a number of police forces around the country of the benefits of this approach, so far the government has not commented as to whether or not this should be done by all police forces, and I would welcome the Minister's views on this. I understand that the Law Commission is about to launch a consultation into how to include misogyny into hate crime legislation, and it is right to wait for the outcome of this work. But I do not believe that this should prevent the government from gathering the data that would then influence the prosecution of this crime or recognising its place in understanding violence against women. I would welcome the Minister's views on their understanding of the role of misogyny in, uh, is in causing violence against women and their assessment to date of the impact this policy is having in the police forces where it has been enacted, such as in Nottingham. Because this amendment will no doubt allow for women to name the experiences they have, but will also allow for women to know they will be believed when they are doing so. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anthony Mangle. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. It's a privilege to be able to speak in this debate and to hear the stories and recounts that so many members have brought to this House. It is a horrific um, uh, experience under domestic abuse, and I have spoken to many of my own constituents who have suffered. Um, however, this is a landmark bill, and I think we should all be rightly proud of what is going on this afternoon. I was sorry not to be able to contribute during this second reading. However, I have listened carefully to members from across this House whose contributions were heartfelt and, added, and have added great weight to the bill. Can I also congratulate uh, the members for Newbury and the members for Wire Forest and the mother of this House for their, her, their extraordinary work in ending the perverse and unjust rough sex defence? Yeah. The addition of that amendment will ensure that perpetrators are no longer able to escape justice from the most heinous and horrific crimes. Madam Deputy Speaker, my ability to speak in this debate is twofold. First, as chair of the all-party parliamentary group on preventing sexual violence in conflict, and second, as a new domestic abuse prevention group has been set up in my constituency of Totnes called SASHA, standing for support, advice, safety, help and aid. My work on the former and my support for the latter, I hope, will be of use to tackling this issue and helping all those who too often suffer in silence. So much of the work that I have done and others have done on preventing sexual violence is based on tackling the culture of impunity, ensuring that justice is delivered, supporting and providing the assistance that so many need. And I feel it is the same of this bill. It is a bill that I hope will deliver for people across this country and serve it to be an inspiration to people around the world and for countries to follow suit. And again, I suggest we should be very proud of that. At the start of this debate, I listened to the words of the members for Maidenhead, uh, Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford, who spoke passionately about the point of advertising and making sure people were aware of the contents of this bill. 
I think that is something that cannot be expressed enough. People understanding what the clauses do, understanding that there will no longer be the injustices of people getting away with flimsy defences. This is something that will end the reality that people think that domestic abuse is just something that occurs. It is of a time. We can do better than that, Madam Deputy Speaker. COVID-19 has, has highlighted the prevalence of domestic abuse, both at home and abroad. The sad fact is that crises and conflicts only see gender-based violence increase, regardless of where you are or where you live. Madam Deputy Speaker, the, spa- the facts speak for themselves. 26 women and girls have been killed since the lockdown began in March, something that I think many of the members of this House have already ra- raised and that is a tragedy in itself. But the lockdown has forced people from their schools, from their places of work, from their social areas, what are essentially refuges, places of safety, and it has pushed them back into the arms of abusers behind locked doors in which they cannot call out, cry out, ask for help. And that is something I think, again, this bill achieves in its entirety. But for every crime, how many will not be reported? For every bruise, for every broken bone, for every commitment of rape, How many people will not be able to come forward? That is something that I think is of serious concern, and we must continually work on this. This bill, as I've already said, is a landmark piece of legislation. It does all the things in the right area, but it is also important to note that it is the first step. It is the first step of many steps that I hope this government and future governments will take to ensure that we can always seek justice for those those who need it. Only when victims have places of safety and the perpetrators feel the full force of the law, will we be able to believe that progress is being made? Uh, I see my time is already running out, but I will just make three very brief points, which is that the creation of a commissioner, the creation of a commissioner, the new civil domestic and protection notice are both incredibly useful, and finally the international jurisdiction is extremely useful. Ms. Jones. Oh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it is an honour to follow the member for Totnes who spoke so passionately, and I do echo and support his calls. It is an honour to speak on this bill, which I know has the potential to change the lives of so many domestic abuse victims across the UK. Colleagues may be aware that I sat on the public committee for this bill and we heard some compelling evidence from a wide range of charities and campaign groups, including Women's Aid, Welsh Women's Aid and the Latin American Women's Rights Service, and I pay tribute to the fantastic work that they do every day. Though it's of course frustrating that their services are acquired and relied upon by so many victims in the first place. I also pay tribute to my fantastic colleague, the honourable, my honourable friend, the Member for Canterbury. I know that her bravery in speaking up on her personal experiences has formed the inspiration for many of our speeches today, and I thank and admire her for her courage. I hope by speaking up I can do my bit to ensure that the experiences of domestic abuse victims remain at the forefront. What's clear to me, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that coronavirus has confirmed and exposed what I already knew to be true based on experiences with domestic abuse victims in my own constituency of Pontypridd. There simply is not enough protection and support for domestic abuse victims. Since December, my team and I have dealt with more cases of domestic abuse than I ever imagined possible. It feels as though domestic abuse is seen by many people as a hidden offence, something that just happens in the newspapers, behind closed doors or somewhere else but just not to people on our doorsteps. Madam Deputy Speaker, the harsh reality is that domestic abuse is a very present threat to so many individuals in so many households that is happening right now, right this minute. Ultimately, 10 years of Tory austerity has impacted the ability of local authorities to fund the specialist services that support survivors of domestic abuse. But that is why I welcome the Bill. But it must go further to provide equal protection for all victims of domestic abuse, men, women and children. A one-size-fits-all approach to tackling domestic abuse will prolong the suffering of victims, and so it is vital that we use this opportunity to ensure that the Bill commits to a coordinated cross-government response to domestic abuse. This legislation must deliver the changes that survivors urgently need in all areas of their lives, from housing to healthcare and in immigration, access to justice and welfare and reform too. And these changes simply must apply to migrant women who we know face a unique set of acute barriers when seeking support. Coupled with the hostile environment at the Home Office, migrant women face the unique threat of having their immigration status used as a form of coercive control, which may prevent them from seeking support. I find it hugely concerning that more than half of police forces in England and Wales confirmed in response to freedom of information requests that they share victims' details with the Home Office for immigration control purposes. Surely it is our duty to protect victims and they should be prioritised ahead of and above of immigration action. 
I would also like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the fantastic work of Laura Richards and others for all of their hard work in relation to new clause 33. Colleagues may be aware that currently domestic abuse costs society at least £66 billion a year, yet this estimate does not include stalking or the psychological impact of stalking and therefore the cost is likely to be much, much higher. It is clear that we could be saving the lives of many and if only the violent histories of domestic abuse perpetrators were actively joined up. It is vital that our police, prison and probation services should be able to identify, assess and manage serial and serious domestic violence perpetrators and stalkers ahead of them committing an offence. This bill presents a real opportunity to better protect victims and intervene and prevent further abuse, but it does fall short of committing to a multi-agency problem-solving approach by the statutory agencies. So to conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, public protection must be at the forefront and our current incident-led approach to patent offences like domestic abuse and stalking is costly with people's lives, especially to the victims. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. After giving my maiden speech in the second reading of this landmark bill, I'd like to acknowledge the cross-party work that's been put in since then during the bill committee that will rightly protect so many and I want to recognise the courage that it will have taken for members across this House to speak of their own experiences and yeah. every victim that's come forward, including my own constituents, which has shaped this bill. In the short time that I have, I'd like to address new clause 15. Home should be a safe place for children, a place of comfort and where they have the support of the parents to love and protect them, free from violence. My honourable friend, the member for Bolsover, spoke in the second reading of his own personal experience, which, quite frankly, reduced myself and many to tears. His bravery to stand up in this house was inspirational, and his words will have rang true for so many. The level of fear that must be felt by children in these cases is unimaginable, but also the feeling of being helpless and unable to intervene. Children really are the hidden victims and these children need the law to protect them. Action for Children rightly state that making these changes could help thousands of children. An analysis by the Children's Commissioner shows that 831,000 children in England are living in households that report domestic abuse. It's the most common additional factor of need identified at the end of children's social care <coughs> assessments for children in need and was identified in more than half of relevant assessments in 2018-19. The bill must reflect that children are also victims of domestic abuse who need support, and New Clause 15 does this. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Nicole Jacobs, the Domestic Abuse Commissioner. Services in my constituency have informed me that this has made a tremendous difference in ensuring resources get to the front line. And I'd like to wholeheartedly thank frontline charities like the Emily Davison Centre in Hyburn, the first ending violence against women and girls hub in the UK. I'm also really glad that this bill emphasises that domestic abuse is not just physical violence, but can also be emotional, coercive, controlling or economic abuse. This definition is in place for all the victims that have felt that their concerns weren't legitimate when their partner constantly criticised or humiliated them, making them believe that that was the truth. This bill is for those who have worried that what what they're having to go through doesn't constitute abuse, when awful comments are made towards them, but it's quickly legitimised through a short apology. Or when someone is constantly reminded by the partner that they aren't good enough and has their successes trivialised. It includes those victims who have been accused of doing something wrong and then left for days on end to think over what they've done, with all forms of contact withdrawn, whilst they mull it over. It's for those who are made to believe that every single thing that happens in their relationship, every fault is somehow their fault, and every action taken by their partner is a consequence of something they've done wrong. It's for those who have been gaslighted so often that their sense of self has become so eroded, that they begin to believe that they are the problem, and that this is normal. Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill stands up and says to those victims, no, it isn't your fault. It isn't you, and it isn't right. And it gives them the support to get out. And that's why I wholeheartedly welcome this bill and all the work that's been done to make sure that that we will be able to keep millions of victims safe and support the survivors of this horrendous crime.
I've been up on the sorry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, for the, the opportunity to speak on such an important issue. In the weeks and months to come, this House will debate the economic recovery from COVID-19, the decisions which will mainly affect women. The poor financial situation of women is one of the main factors contributing to the difficulty of leaving an abusive relationship. Today we have a chance to create a more secure future for the millions of women at risk of domestic abuse across the UK. It is our duty as representatives to understand the environment in which domestic abuse is allowed to manifest and thrive and create a legislation to protect victims from this environment. I represent constituents from the London Borough of Greenwich and Bexley. In the year 2018-19, the London Borough of Greenwich had the highest volume of domestic abuse offences across London. In 2019, Bexley Borough reported an increase in offences by 8.5%. Domestic abuse offences, which are already in the thousands in Greenwich and Bexley, are likely to have increased during COVID-19. By April 2020, the Met reported a 24% rise in domestic violence across London and warned that the true extent of offending is likely to be more. Women in low income households are 3.5 times more likely to experience domestic violence. Whilst everyone across the UK will feel the financial impacts of COVID-19, women will face an increased risk of financial difficulties and will be at more risk of domestic abuse, which is why it's so important we support this bill today. In my constituency of Erith and Thamesmead, women's median earnings are 40% lower than men's and 75% of women's income in my constituency is absorbed by the median private rent costs compared to 44% of men. If single women are priced out of renting an era from Tensmid, how will they feel financially able to leave an abusive relationship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If women are un unable to afford basic necessities for themselves and their children due to, pro um, to mainly low-paid work, insecure work, how will they feel financially able to leave an abusive relationship? Yeah. If women are more likely to lose their jobs due to COVID-19 and face financial instability, how will they feel able to leave an abusive yeah. relationship? Yeah. Yeah. The answer is they won't, and many don't. That's we right. have a responsibility in this House today to support these new measures to protect victims of domestic violence at a time when they are likely to see an increase in fences. These include secure lifetime tenancies in English housing authorities. This will remove barriers that prevent victims from leaving their existing social housing tenancy and support them to remain in homes where the perpetrator has left. Then there's a framework for the new Domestic Abuse Commissioner to hold public authorities to account and then the statutory, statutory de definition of domestic abuse, which will allow victims to report abusive behaviour, which may prevent them from leaving a harmful situation, such as control over their finances. Madam Deputy Speaker, I am also calling on members to support Amendment New Clause 22, access to public funds for survivors of domestic abuse. This amendment will ensure that victims get the vital support and services they need to escape, escape abuse regardless of their immigration status. And the new clause 23, a duty to commission sufficient specialist domestic abuse services for all victims of domestic abuse so that all victims can receive support within their homes, their community or local refuge. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Virginia Crosby. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Erith and Thamesmead for her courage in speaking up for victims of domestic abuse and the Honourable Member for Brecon and Radnorshire who spoke so passionately on behalf of victims in the Bill Committee. Yeah. When it was introduced, the Domestic Abuse Bill was a groundbreaking piece of UK legislation and the Government has followed through on its commitment to update and future-proof the law by bringing this enhanced bill to the House. In preparation for my role on the Bill Committee, I spoke with representatives of Gorewell to understand how domestic abuse presents itself in my constituency of Arnis Morn. Gorewell, which means horizon in English, provides support services for up to 500 victims of domestic and violence and homelessness every single week across North Wales. From my discussions with them and my previous work with other support services, it's clear to me that domestic abuse cuts through every cultural, social and gender divide. Throughout the committee stage, we heard horrific evidence of violence and abuse, and we sought to clarify and understand where support is most needed and how it can best be provided. 
This bill is backed up with genuine funding to help our authorities tackle this horrendous offence. It provides the most comprehensive package of protection for victims of domestic abuse ever seen in the UK. But the committee recognised too that there are some areas in which there are significant gaps in data and where more work is required to understand the best ways we can support specific subgroups of victims. And one such group is migrant victims. We heard much evidence from groups like Southall Black Sisters and discussed this matter at length in the committee stage. We know that some migrant victims have no recourse to public funds and may not be eligible for the destitution domestic violence concession. And the government has already provided over one million of support for these victims through the tampon tax fund. However, this is a complex, this is a complex and nuanced area of concern with a wide variety of associated issues such as immigration, trafficking, child protection and, and asylum. And we identified that there are still significant gaps in our understanding of the needs of this group. I therefore welcome the Government's announcement of a £1.5 million pilot project which will not only support migrant victims to find safe accommodation and services, but will also be designed to ask, assess gaps in provision and gather robust data to inform future funding. Improving our understanding of the needs of migrant victims will allow the Government to invest public money in providing appropriate support mechanisms that are fit for purpose. I'd like to end by saying I entered politics to help those that have no voice. And this landmark legislation has allowed me to do just that. It has been an honour to sit on the Domestic Abuse Bill Committee, and I'm proud of the difference that this government is making to the lives of people all across the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next member on the list has withdrawn, so we go directly to Laura Trott. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to pay tribute to all of those who contributed to this bill. Um, cross part, I'm relatively new to this House, but cross-party working on matters that will make a real difference to people's lives is exactly why I wanted to be here. I want to speak to New Clause 20, uh, a brief mention of New Clause 28, and then a word about uh, parental alienation. So firstly, on New Clause 20, I want to join the fulsome praise for the members for Wire Forest, Newbury and the Mother of the House. What we've passed today is too late for Natalie Connolly, although I hope it will bring some comfort to her family. It is shameful that the perpetrator was given three years and eight months for what he did to Natalie. But it is not too late for the many other victims. And it's, it's very important to note that the, um, the new calls that has been brought in today is about serious harm. It is not just about murder. And I, uh, the um, Centre for Women's Justice say that they have worked on numerous cases which have been dropped due to the rough sex defence. Mm -hmm. And I very much hope that those cases can be looked at again and that the CPS will actually open themselves up to actually bringing these cases forward. Because I cannot imagine how hard it is to go through the process of going to the police, to reporting the case, to be told that because of rough sex that your um, experience is not valid. We must make sure that that is not something which ever happens again for any victims and that people that have gone through this, that their cases can be addressed. So I really hope that the CPS will do something about that. Mm -hmm. On New Calls 28, I understand uh, why it was tabled and I strongly support the review that the front bench announced today. Um, I thought the one point that the um, Honourable Lady for Kingston upon Hull made was very important, which is about access uh, to provision of abortion, particularly for um, people who are victims of domestic violence. It is very true to say that access to abortion services are not the same uh, as those for GPs, and actually that should be the case. We all know that when you take abortion pills, the effects can be uh, quite dramatic and quite quick. And actually, it's very important that uh, women are very close to abortion services to allow dignity in this process, which can be so difficult for so many. So I hope that that's something that we look at as part of this review as we go through. Um, just a word on um, parental alienation, which was brought up um, by my honourable friend earlier. I think we just need to be very, very careful in this area, and I know that the front bench will be. Um, parental alienation is something which is brought up quite frequently in the divorce process. And it is something whereby there is a huge amount of conflict. I'm very nervous about bringing in um, this into uh, the definition of domestic violence because I worry that it will 
it will add something else to bring conflict to a process in which there's always, already so many issues. So I know that the front bench are conscious of this, but I would just, I would just urge that we really, really do tread very, very carefully in this area. Um, I will conclude because I know that, that I have to. Um, <laughs> but we, are, we are all worried about the uh, rise in domestic violence, which has happened uh, during the COVID-19 process. And I hope that what has happened today will send a strong voice to this country, that this House will not tolerate it and we will act to address it. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid there's very little time left, so I have to tell... Uh, everyone except for the next speaker, then I'm afraid that they will not have a chance to speak uh, this evening. I'm sure you will all have worked that out. Ruth Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I am very grateful to be able to take part in this debate and say a few words on behalf of the many people in Newport West who have written to me in recent days about this bill. It is important for us to all acknowledge that domestic abuse is a serious and widespread issue that primarily impacts women and children. There are 2.4 million victims each year and two women a week are killed by a partner or former partner in England and Wales. But I know from representations made to me by members of Newport West, including Rob, that there are men who are also victims of the domestic abuse system and they need and deserve our support too. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Government's own figures state that domestic abuse costs taxpayers in Newport West and across the UK £66 billion a year. The wonderful charity Women's Aid, to whom I pay tribute for their work in campaigning, estimates that £393 million is needed for domestic abuse services annually. So when winding up the debate, I hope the Minister will reassure my constituents that the domestic abuse sector will get the adequate long-term funding required by diverse specialist services, and that funding must be allocated now. I want us to protect the mother the father and the children in Newport West. I want us to protect the migrant woman who has sought peace and safety in the UK. And I want our laws to be a leading example on the world stage. As with COVID-19 and its response, for us to tackle domestic abuse and show its perpetrators they will no longer get away with their actions, there must be a coordinated cross-government response to to domestic violence and abuse. To be truly transformative, This legislation must deliver the changes survivors urgently need in housing, healthcare, immigration system, welfare reform and the family courts. In drawing my remarks and this debate to a close, I would like to pay tribute to the many brilliant women and men on the Labour benches who championed this piece of legislation and who have shown compassion and leadership on these issues. I think of my honourable friends from Birmingham Yardley, from Swansea East from Canterbury, from Hackney North and Stoke Newington, and others who have now left this house, Paula Sheriff, Vernon Coker and Ruth George. I also want to pay tribute to my uh, constituency neighbour and honorary sister, the the member for Torvine, for all his efforts in bringing the bill back to this house. But my final tribute goes to Rachel Williams from my constituency, who endured domestic abuse from her husband for many years. He finally took a shotgun to the hairdressing salon where she was working and shot her twice. Fortunately, Rachel survived and now campaigns to help other victims. She is the epitome of a strong survivor. One in four women experience domestic abuse in their lifetime. Two women a week are killed at the hands of their partner or ex-partner. Three women a week die by suicide as a result of the abuse they have experienced. And two million people experience domestic abuse in England and Wales every year. I make no apology for restating those shocking statistics, but let them remind us all why we are here. With a strong domestic abuse bill strengthened at report stage, we will be able to prove that inaction, apathy and ignorance will finally come to an end once and for all. Thank you. Minister Victoria Atkins. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's fair to say there were moments in the last two and a half years where I did not quite believe that I would be able to stand at the dispatch box and deliver the wind-up in the report stage of this bill. So it is a genuine pleasure to be here at this moment in time doing exactly that. 
And we have seen extraordinary contributions from across the House, not just in this debate, but in the history of this bill and its progress through Parliament. Uh, We have heard from members who have given their own experiences very bravely of the abuse they themselves have suffered, whether it is the Honourable Lady for Canterbury, uh, who moved us all uh, at uh, second reading in October last year, or indeed my honourable friend for Bolsover, who brought into the chamber his own experiences as a child uh, living in an abusive household. These are but two examples. There are sadly many, many more examples we have heard, both, uh, as I say, through the direct experience of of colleagues' own experiences, but also the experiences that we have all tried to bring into the Chamber. There are people whose names we we know as soon as we say names such as Claire, as Rachel, uh, as Holly. We know their stories. And uh, I think if one thing could be drawn from today's debate and the progress of this bill, it is that we don't just talk about them and the experiences that they endured and the experiences that were forced on them, but that we talk about the a legacy that their lives have had and their legacy is written throughout this bill. As Government Minister, I have to, of course, try and respond to uh, the many, many points that have made, been made in this debate. And please, can I apologise now? I'm simply not going to be able to do it. If I give some indication of just how much cross-government working there has been on this bill, as well as in Parliament, uh, we are, I think, now seven departments and counting who were working on this bill. There were some briefing sessions for the committee, I'm told, uh, the committee stage, where when I was trying to speak to um, all the officials who were briefing me, they had to have a queuing system because they couldn't fit in on the conference call system. It gives you an idea of how many people have been involved in this bill, and I thank each and every one of them because I won't have the honour of um, uh, third reading. But I'm going to jump now, if I may, straight to uh, some of the substance um, of today's debate. Many members, uh, including the Honourable Lady for Birmingham Yardley, uh, many members of the opposition, my my right honourable friends for Maidenhead and for Basingstoke, and indeed the Honourable Lady for Edinburgh West, have raised, understandably and rightly, uh, support for migrant victims. Uh, As I reiterate the Government's commitment to helping uh, victims, uh, and I reiterate our commitment to the Support for Migrant Victims Scheme, uh, which I announced at second reading, we expect to make announcements in the summer about this. We will be working with charities. We are working with the Domestic Abuse Commissioner. I spoke to her about it only on Friday. Uh, and we want this scheme to have the trust and the involvement of everyone who is as concerned about migrant victims as we are. We are very much aiming to publish uh, the framework of this scheme ahead of Lord's second reading, and we very much hope that everyone will feel able to uh, support it. Uh, uh, yes, of course. Um, I just uh, wonder if she can clarify for the House that if uh, the approximately um, 3,630 women we imagine might want to access this a year, what if it breaches the 1.5 million that the government have allocated? At that point, will the government be turning people away or will it make more funds available? Yeah. The, the Honourable Lady's rather um, set out the problem that we have is, is measuring the number of women because, of course, she will know that we already help around about 2,500 women under the DDVC. She will also be aware that alongside the pilot project we have the tampon tax fund uh, funding, which is continuing... Uh, and so I very much see both schemes running in tandem with each other. But the Honourable Member for Edinburgh West uh, spoke, uh, has raised at New Clause 27, which is about, uh, concerns the firewall. Uh, she will know that um, uh, we, uh, the government is, or the police are facing um, uh, a super complaint relating to police data sharing for immigration purposes and that there is a judicial review outstanding. However, uh, and obviously we have to wait for those uh, cases, but we are very much working in the meantime with the National Police Chiefs Council to ensure that the guidance they 
grey issue uh, is, uh, uh, does the job that is required. So I would ask her please not to press that amendment. Uh, Honourable members across the House also dealt with new clause 23. We all want to support domestic abuse victims and their children regardless of where they reside. We must, however, ensure that any new statutory duties are properly considered, costed and robust. The new duty on Tier 1 local authorities in Part 4 of the Bill is the product of extensive consultation and engagement with local authorities and sector organisations. The same cannot be said at this stage of New Clause 23, but the Government is committed to gathering this evidence, and I am grateful to the Domestic Abuse Commissioner for agreeing to lead an in-depth investigation on this. We have to be able to understand where services are and are not provided, to identify best practice and consult fully with our charities, local authorities and other important uh, parties before considering any statutory commitments. Any new duty must also be properly costed, taking into account existing provision. We expect the Commissioner to set out her recommendations uh, in a report under Clause 7 of the Bill, and as those who have been following it closely will know, uh, we and others will then have 56 days in which to respond. We will act on this and we will respond promptly. uh, uh, if I may, I'll make some progress. Um, the Honourable Je- the on- uh, other members raised also news- new clause 24, the Honourable Member for Birmingham Yardley in particular. She urged us to act on this. We are doing so. Uh, alongside publishing the Family Harms Panel report, we also published uh, the Government's implementation plan for that report. And my Honourable uh, Friend is acting on the advice, the member for Cheltenham, is acting on the advice of the panel who gave careful consideration to the issue of the presumption of contact uh, and the panel concluded that an urgent review of the presumption should be undertaken. They did not conclude that we should legislate immediately. And my honourable friend for Cheltenham is uh, beginning this work. He's convening the Family Justice Board this month Uh, and we uh, very much hope and anticipate that this work will be completed by the end of the year. We share the sense of urgency, and we will act on it. Uh, The Honourable uh, Member uh, for Pontefract... uh, Forgive me, no. The Honourable Member, who is the Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, uh, raised new clauses 32, 33, and uh, new clause 21 has also been raised during the debate. Uh, In relation to New Clause 21, there's been compelling testimony from several witnesses who gave evidence at committee stage against the introduction of a separate register uh, as proposed in New Clause 21 because this might diminish rather than increase safety. Uh, But we are very conscious of the concerns that the Honourable Lady and others have raised, and uh, we have... um, We continue to work uh, and keep the effectiveness of risk management processes under regular review, as well as the processes being modified in uh, accordance with emerging evidence and good practice. So, for example, the College of Policing is testing a revised domestic abuse risk assessment process with a view to rolling out an improved model across all police forces. And uh, individual forces are also trialling uh, enhanced risk assessment models and uh, uh, there will be an evaluation of the new stalking protection orders as well. So there is work to be done and we will very much keep it under review. Uh, my right honourable friend, the member for uh, Romsey, and my right honourable friend, the member for Basingstoke, ba- both raised the important uh, cases of threats to disclose, and indeed my vulnerable friend for Rushcliffe will have raised it as well. Uh, we very much understand their concerns about this. Uh, uh, threats to disclose, regardless of the connection between the offender and the victim, can in many circumstances uh, already be captured by a range of uh, offences. However, the Law Commission is conducting a review of the law relating to non-consensual taking and sharing of intimate images and uh, uh, with a view to uh, assessing the currency of the law. And in the meantime, we're working with the College of Policing to ensure that the police have all the information they need to make the right uh, uh, charges and arrests where appropriate. Now, uh, in a moment, if I may, the Honourable uh, Lady for Kingston-upon-Hull introduced uh, new Clause 28, and may I thank the House 
for its thoughtful consideration of this clause. Uh, as I set out earlier, the Government considers the right way forward is to undertake a public consultation on whether to make permanent the current COVID-19 measure allowing for home use of early medical abortion pills up to 10 weeks gestation for all eligible women. And in answer to the question the Honourable Lady asked earlier, I can confirm that we will keep the current COVID-19 measures in place until the public consultation concludes and a decision has been made. I understand that the Honourable Lady has been good enough to indicate that in those circumstances she will not push that to an amendment. I thank her and other members for their consideration and uh, uh, their responses. Uh, very quickly, uh, my Honourable Friend for Con Congleton and my Honourable Friend for uh, South Holland and the Deepings uh, uh, have raised important issues regarding research. As Minister for Women, I com I've commissioned or commissioned uh, research into the impact of pornography on attitudes towards women and girls. This uh, research is uh, to be published soon, and so I'd invite her and other honourable members who are concerned about this to save their fire for uh, the online harms paper and uh, that uh, research that is going to be published. And again, of course, I will keep, the government will keep under review the uh, concerns that my honourable friend, right honourable friend, for South Holland has raised in relation to uh, the circumstances of domestic abuse. The Honourable Gentleman, uh, I know, wants to intervene very quickly, if I may. She knows perfectly well that I don't want to divide the House on my amendments because I want the whole of the House to be supporting women who have suffered um, acquired brain injury. Will she simply guarantee to me that she will meet with me and other members of the group before this goes to the House of Lords so that we can clear up any misunderstandings there have been? Yes. Yes, uh, I'm extremely grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. Um, and if I may, I'm, I'm going to gallop to the finish. Uh, can, may I thank all Honourable Members for their contributions, whether it's uh, remotely or not even here at all. The Right Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham, my Honourable Friend for Wire Forest, my Honourable Friend for Newbury, who talks so movingly uh, and rightly about the consequences of uh, the rough sex uh, provisions. And can I sum up by saying that this bill is not just for the victims that we have heard about in this chamber. It is for the victims that we have not been able to help in the past. It is for preventing uh, the harm to victims in the future, including children, that we bring this bill forward. This is a bill that we, in which we can all take pride. We are doing some great work with this, and I thank each and every uh, honourable member for their help in getting it to this stage. Yeah. Order. Under the order of the House of 28th April, I must now put the questions necessary to bring proceedings on consideration to a conclusion. The question is that new clause 15 be read a second time. As members of that opinion say aye. 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 I guess, I guess they are out of practice. As members of that opinion say aye. aye. On the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. The question is that new clause 15 be added to the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. On the contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. I call the Minister to move government new clauses 16 to 18 and 20 formally. Formally. The question is that government new clauses 16 to 18 and 20 be added to the bill. As members of that opinion say aye. aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call Jess Phillips to move new clause 22 formally. I to move formally. The question is that new clause 22 be added to the bill. As members of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. Division. Clear the lobby.
order. Thank you. The question is that new clause 22 be added to the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the ayes, Jeff Smith and Bambus Sharalambu. Tell us for the no's, Michael Tomlinson and David Rutley.
Lock the doors. Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 207. The nose to the left, 330. The eyes to the right, 207. The nose to the left, 330. So the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlock! Uh, I call Jess Phillips to move new clause 23 formally. I beg to move formally. The question is that new clause 23 be added to the bill. As matters that opinion, say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Division, clear the lobby. Order. The question is that new clause 23 be added to the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the eyes, Jeff Smith, and Bambos Charalambo. Tell us for the nose, Michael Tomlinson and David Rutley.
Lock the doors. Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 200. The nose to the left, 338. The eyes to the right, 200. The nose to the left, 338. So the nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock! Unlock! Uh, I call the Minister to move the motion to agree Government Amendments 27 to 30, 36, 37, 31, 32, 38, 33, 34 and 39 formally. The question is that Government Amendments 27 to 30, 36, 37, 31 32, 38, 33, 34, and 39 be made to the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. Ayes have it. The ayes have it. Consideration completed. Third reading? No. I call the Lord Chancellor to move the third reading. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that this bill be now read a third time. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to have made it to the first third reading <laughs> of this bill. As the Honourable Lady, the Member for Birmingham Yardley, and I were reminding ourselves, there were two second reading debates. And the fact that we have reached third reading is a significant milestone, not just in the history of this bill, but also for the millions of people who uh, have either suffered uh, in silence or who have had their stories told either here or, or to uh, uh, courts and other proceedings up and down our country. The passing of this bill by this House marks an important milestone in our shared endeavour to provide better support and protection for the victims of domestic abuse and their children. It's the culmination of over three years of work, and I again pay tribute in particular to my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, for championing this bill, as well as to all honourable and right honourable members who have contributed. And we know that this bill went through a draft bill procedure, one that I uh, commend and support, uh, in particular in this instance, 
because the pre-legislative scrutiny that was undertaken by my right hon. Friend, the Member for Basingstoke, and her colleagues in that joint committee uh, made, uh, made clear and sure that this Bill, as it came to the House, was already in a strong uh, uh, state. Uh, and the Bill was improved during the course of debate. It was uh, scrutinised properly in committee, and I'm grateful to all the committee members of all parties who not only did their duty, but threw themselves in to the process with enthusiasm, uh, vigour and purpose, and I'm grateful to them. Uh, And I think it shows that, contrary to uh, uh, some uh, comment of the commentariat, uh, who often scoff at the committee process in this House, that the committee process is not only alive and well, but it is working well too, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I think that's a vote of confidence uh, in what is a vital part of line-by-line scrutiny. The Bill now expressly recognises the devastating impact of domestic abuse on the lives of children growing up in a household where one parent is being abused by another. Such children are also the victims. And it's right that the Bill recognises this, allowing them to gain better access to the protection and support they need. And we've also, in the course of the passage of this Bill, strengthened protection for victims in court. No victim of domestic abuse should be re-traumatised as a result of being subjected to cross-examination in court by their abuser. And it is already the case that such cross-examination in person is prohibited in the criminal courts, and the Bill now extends this protection to both the family and the civil courts. And we must also do everything we can to enable the victims of domestic abuse to give their best evidence in court. It might mean, for example, uh, giving evidence from behind a screen or via a video link. And again, this principle should apply in all court proceedings. And now we have, as a result of amendment, automatic eligibility for special measures in criminal family and civil proceedings. And we've also delivered on our commitment to make the law crystal clear in relation to the so-called rough sex defence. We now have enshrined uh, in statute that no one can consent to serious harm or indeed their own death for the purposes of sexual gratification. And I uh, join uh, in commendation uh, of, my, of the Right Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham and my, right honor, my Honourable Friend, the Member for Wire Forest, uh, both of whom uh, have uh, met me on uh, several occasions uh, to discuss these matters and to whom I am grateful, and, most importantly, the family of Natalie Connolly, who have assiduously campaigned on this issue. issue. And I'll give way to my Honourable Friend. Thank you. Um, I raised in uh, the uh, report stage uh, the link between uh, rough sex and pornography um, and recent surveys indicating that there is indeed a a, a link. I wonder if the Minister will be good enough to perhaps um, give a little more information about the assurance that I sought that Government would um, take early action to address concerns about harms resulting from pornography. Well, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, and I'm grateful for the way in which she brought this issue to the debate via her amendment and the constructive approach that she has consistently taken on this issue. Yes, I can give her that assurance, and it will come in several forms. There is, of course, work that's being done by the Government Equalities Office, research into this particular uh, sensitive and important issue, and that research will be published soon, and we will have opportunity via legislation, via the online harms uh, policy, uh, which uh, my uh, uh, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media, uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sport, is responsible for. Again, another vital opportunity for early action to deal with the issue that she rightly raises, and I'm grateful to her. It's been a prime example of how the government, parliamentarians, and campaigners have come together to identify an area where the law falls short and to do something about it. And yet we recognise that in relation to a number of other issues, there is still more work to be done. The very recent publication of the report by the expert panel on harm in the family courts 
and the government's implementation plan affords, I think, a unique opportunity, Madam Deputy Speaker, for the family justice system to reform how it manages privately, uh, private family law cases involving children. And I, can I put on the record my own personal commitment to this process? That report was uncompromising. It made for difficult reading. It was critical, but I felt strongly that it had to be published warts and all, because if we are going to deal with this problem, we have to be honest about the failures of the past uh, and, through that process of uh, honest assessment, come up with something better. We owe it to the families who look to the court as a place of resolution rather than a place of further abuse, strife, hurt and horror. The panel received over 1,200 submissions in evidence, and the report provides significant insight into the experience that victims of domestic abuse have in our family courts. It's a launchpad for the actions that we are going to take to better protect and support children and domestic abuse victims throughout private family law proceedings. And there will be more work to be done, because I strongly uh, believe that uh, whilst the adversarial uh, principle is an important one and serves to advance the interests of justice in many settings, uh, I take the view that in private family law proceedings in particular, we have to uh, look for a better way to resolve these issues, to achieve a higher degree of justice for everybody involved, not least the children whose voices must be heard and who, despite the best efforts uh, of the Children Act of 30 years ago, still, I believe, do not necessarily uh, get their voices heard in the way that I think uh, we owe it to them to allow. And, and I will give way to my right hon. Friend. Why is the mood to... Uh, to concede and uh, be generous. Might I ask him to look again at the issue of maximum and minimum sentences? Of course he's right that during the legal proceedings victims should be treated with the respect and regard they deserve. Once people are convicted, there need to be exemplary sentences, there need to be just deserts. Will you look at that uh, through the prism of the amendment that I tabled, which I've no doubt inspired and impressed him? <laughs> Well, I, I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend, and he tempts me into uh, new territory. What I will say to him is that uh, as uh, the government and I develop uh, a, a white paper on sentencing reform, which will be published later in the year, we will have ample opportunity to engage properly on these issues. Uh, he knows that I come to this uh, uh, role with, um, shall we say, a little bit of form on the issue of sentencing and a long experience about it, and I want to uh, use that white paper as the opportunity to uh, set something uh, clear uh, and firm and understandable that will only increase public confidence in the sentencing system in England and Wales. I was going to go on to deal with the question of migrant victims. My honourable friend, the member for Louth and Horn Council, can I, at this stage, pause to pay warm tribute to my honourable friend, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, and indeed my honourable friend, the member for Cheltenham, uh, 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 one of my ministerial team at the Ministry of Justice, who uh, together didn't just do their duty, Madam Deputy Speaker, they did it with um, zeal, with passion, and with a deep commitment to the issues. A commitment that I know is shared by opposition spokesmen too, uh, and I pay tribute to them for their assiduous work on this issue. True cross-party cooperation can move mountains, Madam Deputy Speaker, and this bill is, uh, I think, an, em an emblematic example of that uh, important principle. Uh, I was talking about the important issue of migrant victims of domestic abuse uh, and the review that has been conducted uh, uh, and the acknowledgement that more needs to be done to support migrant victims who don't qualify under the domestic, uh, domestic violence concession or other mechanisms it is very clear. But we do need to assess precisely that need, as my honourable friend outlined, and that's why the pilot scheme of uh, £1.5 million to be launched later in the year will provide additional support to the mechanisms that uh, have already been discussed uh, and also provide the necessary evidence to help uh, inform decisions as to a long-term solution. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, providing better protection and support for victims of domestic abuse and their children is at the very heart of this Bill. Uh, in the first second reading debate, I told my own story about being a young barrister dealing with a domestic abuse case, one of many that were dealt with, shall we say, somewhat differently in those days uh, than they are now. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we should be complacent in any way uh, about where we have come to with regards to the way in which we deal domestic vi with domestic violence. But I think it is right to say that uh, if, the, if the phrase "it's only a domestic" uh, hasn't previously be, been consigned to the to the history books, this bill will make sure that it is. We owe it to the 2.4 million victims a year to ensure that the justice system and that local support services work better for them. And I will give way to my right hon. I'm very grateful to my right hon. Friend for giving way. I'm also grateful to him for his uh, kind remarks that he made uh, earlier. Uh, he has just outlined the importance of this bill. Will the Government do everything it can to ensure that in timetabling this Bill through the other place, it is given the priority it needs to be given to ensure we can get it on the Statute Bill as soon as possible? Well, I'm very grateful to my right hon. Friend, and I, uh, with alacrity, give her that undertaking. I know that uh, my colleagues in the other place will uh, share the same uh, ambition that we have here, and that I will work with them to make sure that this bill uh, uh, makes its uh, proper passage through that House so that we can give it the royal assent that we all want to see it uh, attain. Mm. Ultimately, Madam Deputy Speaker, we all just want the abuse to stop. But in the meantime, we must and we will do everything we can to protect vulnerable people, to protect victims and their children, and to offer them the safety and the support they so desperately need and deserve. Yeah. I commend this bill tonight. Yeah. The question is that the bill be now read the third time. Jess Phillips. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It seems after... Um, it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman, and after three years, the sort of delight that I might get the last word on this <laughs> is a pleasure to me. Um, the... The thanks that uh, the Lord Chancellor has laid out, uh, I, I'm going to echo some of them. When I was speaking to the Deputy Chief Whip early, he said, you know, it's th third reading, Jess, which I haven't prepared for at all because I didn't actually think we'd get to it. Um, you, you're not allowed to just go on about what you want in the bill, so uh, I might just sit down uh, because that is my forte, is going on about what I want in the bill. And as this bill passes into its third reading, I feel slightly bereft about uh, not updating it any more. Um, it seems that since uh, I was elected to this House, uh, this bill has been going through, and I pay huge tribute uh, to the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead for her work, um, at, um, both at, in the Home Office uh, and then latterly as Prime Minister. Um, I told a story in uh, the committee about how on one occasion when um, she was then the Home Secretary, she, I was a candidate in the election and she visited the refuge where I worked and I was allowed to work from home that day <laughs> for showing that I might show up to the organisation. Uh, with the Home Secretary there. She visited where I used to work on a number of occasions and has always... Uh, been, I would say, mostly in the right place around domestic abuse and we wouldn't be here today had it not been for her efforts. I also pay tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Basingstoke uh, and the work done by the Joint Committee which was very thorough and very detailed and uh, has definitely led to this bill being in the position that it is. I also I absolutely will lady for giving way on that point and it just gives me the opportunity to thank the other members of the committee in both houses, both the other place and here, for the assiduous way in which they attended the committee and for the excellent evidence that we were given by a large number of organisations um, and Madam Deputy Speaker also the clerks of this house who when it comes to these sorts of bills go from a standing start to being ready for action almost overnight and they, they have our undying gratitude. Yeah. Yeah.
I, I couldn't agree with the Honourable, Vice Honourable Lady more, the clerks of this House. I don't think I had quite understood until I was in the position that I'm currently in exactly how much the clerks of this House do, but I feel like Kevin from the clerks' offices currently on my speed dial. Uh, I feel I'll definitely be uh, buying a hat if he ever gets married. Uh, I feel very close to the clerks of this House now. Um, I also want to pay tribute to um, the, the, the ministers on Bill Committee and Rightly, everybody today has paid tribute to um, the, the ministers, both from uh, the Home Office and uh, the Ministry of Justice, in their efforts and their open hearts and minds throughout this bill, and I, and I would certainly echo that. I also um, want to pay tribute to a member who is no longer here, Sarah Newton, who, um, in the, uh, I, I was about to say she was the first minister I ever sat down and talked to about the bill, but actually I think that that was the member for Staffordshire Moorlands was the first minister. I actually ever sat down and had a meeting with about the bill, and so I wanted to pay some tribute to them also. And to, I suppose, now the, the members on uh, my side of the House that I, w I wish to thank. First of all, I, I, I wish to say a, a big thank you to my honourable friend, the member for Torvine, who, since he has taken his position, has really prioritised the issue of domestic abuse um, from uh, certainly within the issue of the crisis that we are currently facing in this country with COVID-19. Every day, um, he is certainly pushing for things to be better for victims uh, in England, Wales and across uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, the member for Hove, who was uh, uh, very ably um, dealt with these issues on committee. Um, but I, I also just want to make... Um, a special mention to the member for Canterbury who felt that she couldn't speak today and we owe her an enormous debt of gratitude for what she has done. I am going to thank... I'm going to inevitably forget somebody. Never list a group of people because you will inevitably forget some of them. I do it with my children, so let's see how we can go. I wish to thank Women's Aid, Safe Lives, South All Black Sisters, Lars, Nicole Jacobs, Evor... Uh, Vera Baird and every single organisation, Hestia, Refuge, all of the organisations who every day are working across this country, but not just to support people directly, but they have worked on this bill just as much as anybody in this House. They put um, a lot of effort into the policy work that they do, and we are better representatives for the work that all of those organisations have done. I welcome what the Lord Chancellor has said with regard to the timeliness and the, the severity and importance that he puts on the issue around the family courts that he has said today. And also I look forward to the details of the review um, and the pilot scheme into migrant women's support services. I came to this house inspired by women and children who had been abused and it is an honour to stand in the third reading of the Domestic Abuse Bill to show that in this house, in this place that can seem completely otherworldly and the words written in the bill will seem in many cases completely otherworldly to the vast majority of people who I have supported in my life as victims of domestic abuse. But the message that it sends is that we can hear them, and that is a message we should send loud and clear from this place. And I hope that finally, in third reading part one, I hope that the third reading of this bill only ever has a part one. Yeah. Sir Robert Neal. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. There have been two very powerful speeches, and it's right because this is a really important bill. And it is a major aspect of reform of family private law. Lord Chancellor is entitled to great credit for what he has done. It's the second time, actually, in almost a fortnight, that he has brought in major reforms. And I think we should remember that, because we have changed both our reform of divorce law and now in relation to how we deal with private family law. Well, I welcome the comments from the Honourable Lady from the Opposition Front Bench, because this is something we ought to deal with together. This is a difficult and complex area. 
As Chairman of the Justice Committee, we have wrestled with some of those issues from time to time. As a practitioner, as I think a constituent M C MP and as a human being, we have seen the consequences of some of the deficiencies in the law as it currently stands. This is a major reform and we shall welcome it. There is more to do, I have no doubt, but I think this is a good step forward and in particular the changes to the procedures in the Family Court, which have taken some time to get through, are really important. I hope that we will now see this properly resourced. And I hope also that we will make sure that we follow that through in some of the understanding that is required as to how, for example, pre acquired brain injury, a point made by an honourable member for Rhonda in a previous debate, uh, and some of the pressures that come upon people through coercive control, which this government has recognised beyond most others, are taken on board as to how we then keep practice, if you like, in line with the letter of the law. Uh, the other thing I'd simply say is this I'm particularly pleased that we've dealt with the issue of. Uh, non-fatal strangulation in the bill. It always struck me as a practitioner that this was a real difficulty, but you couldn't prove the necessary intent under Section 18 of the Offences Against the Person Act. Uh, but uh, the irony was, if somebody died, you could prove manslaughter, but the saddest was you couldn't prove anything that's, that's less. And so that's another gap that's filled by this bill. An awful lot of really important points that are made by this but the overall thrust of this is, I suspect, that we are determined to improve the situation of victims in the criminal courts and in the family courts. Because crime, ironically, got in front of the family division in many ways in this. The protection of witnesses, uh, the, the special care that should be given to people. Repeatedly, judges and practitioners have sought this. That's been delivered. I hope that now we can move forward to a better reform of private family law generally, but can I just make a final prod to the Lord Chancellor in a nice way? That requires resource. That requires resource for the judges. It requires the ability for people to sit the requisite hours, and it requires resource for those who undertake a number of the matters that we refer to in this bill uh, to undertake onerous duties on behalf of the public to be properly recompensed. I suspect that he will do that, um, but we ought to welcome this, and above all welcome the fact that we are moving away from a rather blame culture in the way we deal with family law into something which is much, much more constructive. And maybe we should lose that, move that forward in relation to a number of other matters too. Eva Cooper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In the last few minutes remaining, I just want to thank the Government for bringing forward this important bill and for listening as well, and to thank Ministers, but also to thank the Labour uh, Shadow Front Bench, who have been so passionate advocates for improvements to the bill, and to members across this House who have come together and put forward important amendments, proposals, reforms, and very much come together in the kind of cross-party spirit we would expect to dealing with such a a terrible crime that destroys lives and that haunts children's future for very many years to come. We've already come a long way since um, the Select Committee's report on domestic abuse two years ago, but also since um, I raised with the former Home Secretary, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, um, questions about having a domestic abuse commissioner back in, I think, 2012, and we discussed this. So we have um, seen great progress made as a result of cross-party working, but as a result of the decisions that the Government has taken to put these measures into practice. This, and we all of us owe thanks to the many organisations who work to support domestic abuse victims right across the country and who work so tirelessly every single day to rescue families, to put lives back together and to give people a future. I also want to join tributes to my honourable friend, the member for Canterbury, because her words and her bravery in speaking out has already provided great comfort and growing confidence to many other people across 
across the country who've experienced something similar and her reaching out and saying you are not alone has been extremely powerful to do so. But we also need to think with some humility about what happens next because although we may have come together and agreed legislation, legislation doesn't solve everything and we also know this is about not just how legislation is used but also how government policies work, how partnerships work, how things happen right across the country as well. And that humility should be even greater at a moment when we have come together to say how important this legislation is at the same time as domestic abuse has been rising during the coronavirus crisis. And it is to all of those who are still suffering that we owe a ever greater commitment to help them and rebuild their lives. Yeah. 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 I would seek your assistance. I want to place on the record my thanks to all the officials who have laboured very hard in both the Home Office and the MOJ on this matter. I would seek your guidance as to how I place that on the record. <laughs> well, as the most brilliant lawyer in the chamber, in the house, the, the, Lord, Chancellor, the, Lord, the Lord Chancellor has made his point perfectly and and indeed rarely have i seen a bill with such cooperation from everyone right across the house and and uh, wonderfully worked on by the clerks and and rarely have i seen a third reading conclude uh, with everybody being so satisfied and pleased at the result so the question is that the bill be now read the third time as well as that opinion, say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes yeah, have it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I will pause.